Chapter 8 Homeostasis Seeking Balance in the Midst of Distortion A homeostatic system, by its very nature, is always in flux, self-correcting when it strays too far in one direction or another. Never static, it is animated by a process of continuous discovery, balancing and rebalancing based on the information available through self-monitoring. Although the word homeostasis was not specifically used by the founding fathers of the Austrian tradition, its meaning is deeply embedded in this school of thought, as is its observations about the functioning of the economy, as it is pushed and pulled by entrepreneurial forces into and out of stationarity. Just as the Austrians anticipated many of the recent discoveries of behavioral scientists, in particular the work of hyperbolic discounting, we will see that the Austrian tradition describes the market process in ways very compatible with modern cybernetics, the study of communication and control within a system. In its natural state, a system, from a forest to a market, achieves balance through internal governance and guidance, which depend upon the system's own ability to internally communicate and react to changing conditions due to the interactions of a variety of players, whether buyers and sellers in a marketplace, trees and herbivorous predators, especially fire in the forest, or entrepreneurs deciding when and how to become ever more roundabout to meet the ultimate demands of consumers. Within the system, errors will occur and resources will need to be reshuffled. As such, there will be isolated individual failures, whether we are dealing with forests or factories, banks or bakeries. The process will take care of itself as long as there is integrity within the feedback loop and accurate, non-manipulated information is allowed to flow, resulting in a suitable mix and magnitude of growth given the available resources, whether savings for investment or sunlight and soil for trees. However, attempts to intervene and manage such systems typically end in a paradox, whereby the very opposite of an intended result is achieved. Instead of order and balance, there is distortion that leads ultimately to destruction. Without a functioning feedback loop, the system goes haywire like a faulty thermostat that allows the interior of a house to become as hot as a furnace or as cold as a freezer. When the feedback loop is short-circuited by distortion and manipulation, rather than the system being one that cancels out its errors, it is transformed into one that even magnifies them such that the errors of inappropriate, unhealthy growth take over the system. When this occurs, the system breaks down. There is disconnection in entrepreneurial decisions of whether to invest in more roundabout production based on anticipated demand from consumers, which will probably not materialize, or whether to exploit current higher demand. Trees attempt to thrive beyond the capacity of the forest ecosystem to produce and sustain healthy growth. Yet inevitably, even if the system has been forcibly pushed far out of balance and its governing forces debilitated, homeostasis will eventually re-emerge as the communication and governing forces are freed once again. At this point we should pause to clarify one aspect of our discussion that might trouble some listeners. How can we speak of a system's internal communication when there may be no conscious mind at work? And how can we define thriving or failures within a system in a non-arbitrary way? In the case of a thermostat, these terms might be innocuous enough, since we can take the goals of the human designers as given. But what about an ecosystem? Such talk might even seem inapplicable to the market economy itself, which is not consciously planned by any single mind or group of experts, as the Austrians themselves stress. To diffuse possible misunderstanding, let me be clear that in this discussion I am drawing on the concepts and terminology of the cybernetics literature, which we will explore later in the chapter. The pioneers of cybernetics described self-regulating feedback mechanisms as teleological, a term suggesting that they have a goal or purpose. Now it's true that later critics suggest an alternate term, teleonomic, as mentioned with von Bayer in Chapter 4, to characterize systems that merely exhibit apparent purpose. For example, the standard view of modern biologists is that evolution is a teleonomic process because although life forms demonstrate great internal order and self-regulation, they were presumably not consciously designed. However, such distinctions are unnecessary for our purposes because I am focusing on the intentional teleological behavior of market participants, what Ludwig von Mises called human action when it comes to the interactions of these intentional individuals in the broader marketplace 
Even Austrian economists can and do quibble over the extent to which the resulting outcome is due to rationality versus spontaneous order. Yet what is not controversial is the notion that capitalism, with private property and free markets, serves as an exceptional institution to mobilize the localized information that is dispersed among many different individuals, each with admittedly subjective goals. The market's ability to do so, relying on system-wide equilibration forces, feedback mechanisms, is my focus in this chapter. And when we discuss financial crashes and depressions later, the listener will have little difficulty understanding what constitutes a good versus bad outcome. The Teleology of the Market We have already explored in the last chapter the economic parable of the land of Nibelungen in the context of the market process and some stylized facts about booms and busts. In the current chapter, we discuss the same topic but from the perspective of homeostasis. In booms, assets are overaccumulated and bid up in value to untendable levels until homeostasis prevails, a teleological goal-seeking mechanism Kant's very teleomechanism of regulation that ultimately guides the system back to the balance of stationarity and reality. Perhaps it is difficult to visualize an impersonal horde of ravenous speculators as part of the rebalancing process, yet that is precisely what is occurring. The market does not just bob around rudderless. It is the flock of birds that appears to swoop and dive aimlessly, while hidden within its cascading members are the navigators themselves. Although there are random entrepreneurial errors that take place, as we heard about in Chapter 7, the entrepreneurial process is teleological because volitional beings bring about a series of causes and effects in reaction to changes within the system. The system itself moves or strives towards stationarity, balance. With this understanding of the markets, we can see the advantage of also taking a teleological approach to investing, as Siegfried, our entrepreneurial hero, does, and as we do with Austrian investing, with a means-end strategy that is predicated on the knowledge of capitalistic investing as an intertemporal process. To observe and appreciate the homeostatic nature of the market, the market that, as Mises reminded us, is a process, we must shift our perception and stop thinking of systems as being driven only as a hapless victim of random shocks, such as lightning strikes that start fires and instead embrace the reality of the system as adapting to those shocks in an ongoing discovery process. Clearly, though, there is a dichotomy. On one hand, how things should function in their natural state, and on the other, how and why they fall into dysfunction, where the fault is almost always outside manipulation, not the system itself. Yet that is not what most people see. They cannot see the forest because they are trying to save each individual an immediate tree and in so doing lose all depth of field and of focus on the generations of trees and the intertemporal search for their mix and magnitude of growth within the forest to come. All too often, particularly today, the focus is only on the shocks and fires with the desire to control and prevent. The desire is to interfere, and perhaps innocently, override the system's natural governors that maintain balance. In so doing, things are made so much worse. We have thus succumbed to a blind faith in bureaucratic authority over natural processes. And yet we do well to heed the words of Austrian economist and Mises protege Friedrich Hayek, who observed, Before we can even ask how things might go wrong, we must first explain how they could ever go right. Homeostasis is the process of how things go right. Within the roundabout of capital accumulation in a progressing economy, the figurative directional going right, that is, indeed, how things go right in a healthy manner. Homeostasis recalls, sure, the propensity of all systems to restore balance through self-writing movements that in a natural world are no more disruptive than ripples on a pond. We think of the Taoist concept of reversion, of things becoming their opposite, soft in order to be hard, weak before strong, retreating before advancing, and Clip's paradox of losing in order to win. An intertemporal balance can be achieved, however, only when communication and controls are allowed to function naturally. The Yellowstone Effect The study of homeostasis and its pursuit in natural systems brings us back once again to what has become our primary pedagogical tool, nature's classroom, the forest. We start by reminding ourselves of the particular dynamic within the scenarios explored in Chapter 2. 
The head-to-head -head competition that occurs when conifers that are slowly growing at first try to thrive amid the faster-growing and sunlight-stealing angiosperms. In a natural forest, without the practice of forest management, the endless tug-of-war battle of succession for available resources is a part of an elaborate homeostatic process whereby the angiosperms dominate for a while in prime fertile areas where they can outperform, at least at first, the competition. While the conifers take root in the out-of-the-way places, rocky and inhospitable, where few can survive. Once areas of the angiosperm-dominated forest become overgrown, they become prone to small wildfires. When fire breaks out, the land is cleared and the way is open for the patient conifers, nature's great fire opportunists, to reseed. This is the continuous intertemporal turnover of the forest's succession. Not only are wind-borne seeds brought to the fire-cleared land, but the resin-coated serotonous cones of many conifer species have been opened by the flames and intense heat of the fire. The system has natural regulators that control unsuitable growth and help to keep it balanced with the available resources, the savings of the forest. As we recall, this is particularly important when the forest experiences recruitment bottlenecks, such as among conifers that are mal-seeded among the faster-growing angiosperm competitors. The young conifers fail to reach a threshold of development sufficient to accelerate to maturity. Our tortoises never make it to becoming hares, and instead become sick and spindly, literally consuming each other as they grasp a meager share of the resources and remain extremely fire-prone. When flames sweep through, these stunted trees are wiped out and resources are naturally redistributed to healthier growth. The fire, therefore, is not merely destructive, but must be viewed as a catharsis, a cleansing process, an agent of creative destruction, to borrow a term from the Austrians, and part of the cybernetic control and communication within the system to return the forest to homeostatic balance. As Murray Rothbard would say, the fire is the recovery process, and far from being an evil scourge, is the necessary and beneficial return of the forest to optimum efficiency. Forest fire turns especially deadly, however, when smaller blazes are suppressed, creating the illusion of fire protection. Admittedly, fire is a complex subject in forestry. On one hand, it would seem to make intuitive sense that forest preservation would mean limiting, controlling, or outright prevention of fires that kill trees. At the risk of oversimplification, however, such thinking has proved to be a Lee strategy, focused on the direct means of today's trees and keeping the forest status quo at all costs. The roundabout sure strategy is the willingness to pursue, or more specifically in this case, allow, an intermediate objective of naturally occurring fires that do destroy trees and some healthy specimens right along with the unhealthy ones now, in order for a succession of forest growth to emerge intertemporally. Between conifers and angiosperms in particular, the ecosystem must always discover the right balance, which changes and adapts to climate and other environmental shifts. Fire is a natural dynamic force of change, like any other predator, whose presence is crucial to maintaining the health of other species, just as rabbits would overrun and destroy the meadow and ultimately starve themselves were it not for the foxes that hunt them. When a population within an ecosystem exceeds the amount of resources present, too many rabbits in the meadow, it must be controlled by predator consumers, the foxes, which do not have to try very hard to capture their next meal. And when the system reaches balance, just the right number of rabbits, the predator consumers are also managed. They go hungry or move elsewhere. In the case of the overgrown forest, control most often comes from the most ravenous and indiscriminate of all herbivorous predators, fire, thus becoming the consumer that most often accomplishes the control function. Smaller, low-intensity fires manage the forest with great expediency, reducing density by clearing underbrush, including the stunted and spindly conifers that cannot compete with larger angiosperms, while leaving the canopy growth untouched. Paradoxical, yes, but forestry practices of old that have regained respect of late underscore the importance of letting small fires burn in order to manage the forest and to prevent the bigger ones that inevitably and cruelly result from attempts to stop fire. Suppression now undeniably leads to greater destruction later on. Once again, our bad economists, who continually crop up in this audiobook, clearly one of its main points. 
Nowhere in the history of forestry was that evil more savagely felt than in Yellowstone National Park in 1988, when nearly 800,000 acres, well over one-third of the park, burned and or suffered fire damage. It was a catastrophe of unprecedented proportion in the history of the National Park Service, and its root cause was fire suppression. The spread of fire suppression mentality can be linked to the establishment of forest management in the United States, such that by the early 1900s, forests became viewed as resources that needed to be protected. In other words, burning was no longer allowed. The danger in this approach became tragically apparent in Yellowstone, which was recognized by the late 1980s as being overdue for fire. Yet smaller blazes were not allowed to burn because of what were perceived to be risks that were too high given the dry conditions. And so smaller fires were put out, but in the end could not be controlled and converged into the largest conflagration in the history of Yellowstone. Not only did the fire wipe out more than 30 times the acreage of any previously recorded fire, it also destroyed summer and winter grazing grounds for elk and bison herds, further altering the ecosystem. Because of fire suppression, the trees had no opportunity or reason to ever replace each other, and the forest thus grew feeble and prone to destruction. A lattice of unwarranted and anemic growth, which was ill-seeded from the start and never had a chance of reaching maturity, became a grid that linked and transmitted the costs of the forest's distortion to a much wider area than would have been affected by a series of natural, smaller fires over the years. It was the Yellowstone effect. Lessons from the Distorted Forest The disastrous Yellowstone Fire of 1988 leads to the conclusion that 100 years of fire suppression, a zero-tolerance approach to stamp out even naturally occurring low-intensity blazes, had made the forest dangerously prone to catastrophe. It becomes clear, then, that low-intensity blazes marshal the resources and oversee an orderly succession in the homeostatic forest, as evident in patterns of heterogeneity, conifers here and angiosperms there. The back and forth of a forest system seeking equilibrium avoids the dangerous overgrowth caused by everything trying to thrive all at once, extracting resources for survival now, foregoing the roundabout strategy. In nature, as in the economy, there must be a free transfer of resources between higher order and lower order production. When human intervention interferes with nature's cycles, the system's natural homeostatic negative feedback forces are weakened, negative feedback being the system communicating to its internal governors how far from balance it is, and the governors then bringing it back. From a forestry point of view, the lessons have been learned. In 1995, the Federal Wildland Fire Management Policy recognized wildfire as a crucial natural process and called for it to be reintroduced into the ecosystem. As I observed in a 2011 piece in the Wall Street Journal, central bankers, too, could learn a thing or two from their forestry brethren. The federal government has another fire suppression policy that started, coincidentally, just a few years before the Yellowstone blaze, with the 1984 Continental Illinois Too Big to Fail bank bailout. This was followed by Alan Greenspan's pronouncement immediately after the 1987 stock market crash that the Federal Reserve stood by with liquidity to support the economy and the financial system. In its actions in the 1980s, the Federal Reserve telegraphed to the world that it would no longer tolerate fires of any size, which heralded the birth of the Greenspan put. In the financial forests of our own making, suppression is particularly problematic and even deadly. Excess and malinvestment thrive for a time, only to be destroyed by ravages caused by their own vulnerability. Yet, as we will see, even such high-intensity fires of the forest and financial varieties will free up and redistribute resources. In the case of the market, it releases capital to areas previously avoided due to the myopic distortions of monetary intervention. The Austrian school naturally understood this well, as we explored with the Austrian business cycle theory as explained in Chapter 7. Central bankers and interventionists need to stop approaching the system as one driven by random shocks, because this mindset leads them to manipulate and attempt to control the system, a cycle that destroys far more in the long run than it saves temporarily. The longer their erroneous thinking persists, the more out of balance things become, until there is a tinderbox of malinvestment, ready to ignite in a massive, uncontrollable inferno. 
density, overgrowth, and uniformity, too much of one thing, namely immediate returning or high-yielding capital, as opposed to the more roundabout variety, growing in the economy and fertilized by distortion, are the evidence of malinvestment in the economy, exceeding the amount of available resources. Investment cannot exceed savings any more than seeding in the forest can exceed land, nutrients, water, and sunlight. But under these interventions, the system acts as if that's what is happening. This is what makes the boom so delusive and ultimately illusory. Here we encounter the profound paradox that government interventions systematically achieve the very opposite of their intended goals. So governments, unlike entrepreneurs, try as they might and despite perhaps good intentions, I'll give the Paul Krugmans of the world the benefit of the doubt, simply cannot achieve their intended outcomes by interfering with the operation of the system. They cannot act teleologically, as it were. Governments and central banks undermine the natural homeostatic process by short-circuiting the governors and adaptive teleological processes in the system. Suppression of the market's natural homeostatic tendencies, such as proclaiming things to be too big to fail, or by cutting interest rates when the stock market takes a dive, only makes things worse by artificially propping up assets that should be allowed to fail and free up resources for another, perhaps more productive attempt. A perfect example is the Troubled Asset Relief Program of 2008, or TARP, a completely unnecessary action by the U.S. government to buy equity stakes in and underwater assets from financial institutions as a response to the crisis that, like a wildfire, was trying to correct the artificial distortions in the system. Rather than precluding a catastrophic event, TARP precluded rational market adjustments. Suppression makes the cure that much worse than the initial ill, until exponentially more damage is done. Calling to mind the wry observation of Mises, if a man has been hurt by being run over by an automobile, it is no remedy to let the car go back over him in the opposite direction. Blaming wild market volatility on the animal spirits of the herd mentality takes the focus off where it belongs, on the actions of the government. Instead of functioning as instruments of information, signaling to entrepreneurs how and when best to serve consumers, interest rates are perpetually manipulated by central bank actions to the point of meaninglessness. Artificial changes in interest rates become a deceptive feint by which entrepreneurs succumb to malinvestment because they believe there are more resources, i.e. savings in the system than there really are. Monetary policy insidiously plays with our time preferences and our very ability to engage in economic calculation. The greater the distortion, the greater destruction needed to correct it. The financial crisis of 2008 could have been the wake-up call that, like the Yellowstone fires of 1988, alerted so-called managers to the dangers of trying to override the natural governors of the system. Instead, the Federal Reserve, with its head ranger Ben Bernanke, has deluded itself into thinking it has tamped down every little smolder from becoming a destructive blaze, but instead all it has done is poured the unnatural fertilizer of liquidity onto a morass of overgrown malinvestment, making it even more highly flammable. One day, likely sooner than later, as argued in the next chapter, it will burn, and when that happens, the Fed will be sorely lacking in buckets and shovels, and must succumb to the flames. Market Cybernetics The devastation of a Yellowstone forest fire, or the financial crisis of 2008, and all the big blazes yet to be, do not need to occur. Without the distortion of intervention, the system can govern itself. In the Austrian view, healthy growth of an economy occurs through heterogeneous capital structures that are allowed to morph and adapt through the intertemporal coordination of production in sync with consumer time preference. Within the process, entrepreneurs rely upon price signals to guide their decision-making in order that resources might be deployed in the most appropriate ways. Respecting the process allows homeostasis to be pursued throughout a connection that detects, communicates, and responds to the available resources in the system. To better understand this connection, we explore a branch of the interdisciplinary control systems theory of engineering, known as cybernetics. The word cybernetics comes from the Greek kybernetes, meaning pilot or governor, and kybernon, to steer or govern. Cybernetics focuses on the role of servo mechanisms, or servos as they are called, that regulate systems through the detection of errors and the responsive use of feedback 
specifically negative feedback that tells a system when it is out of balance, and by how much in order to correct. For our purposes here, we might think of cybernetics as how servos regulate systems, from machines to bodies, through such mechanisms as the steam engine governor, a thermostat, and the functions that control body temperature or blood glucose level. The failure of the feedback process in maintenance of healthy blood glucose levels leads to diabetes. Norbert Wiener, coincidentally his last name means Viennese, although he was born in Missouri, was a mathematician and originator of the field of cybernetics, who saw homeostasis as a process in which some sort of feedback is not only exemplified in physiological phenomena, but is absolutely essential for the continuation of that system. Feedback is crucial and must be continuously given by and within the system in order to make the necessary, typically small, corrections to keep on course. Sometimes that correction happens quite literally, as in the example given by Wiener of the car being driven on an icy road. The driver makes a series of small movements with the wheel, which are not enough to induce a major skid, but provide feedback to our kinesthetic sense whether the car is in danger of skidding, and we regulate our method of steering accordingly. The concept of control by information feedback makes intuitive sense. In order to operate in an environment, one must have input from it and thus make continuous adjustments to compensate for certain conditions or changes in conditions. Each movement is a return to balance in the moment, never expected to be permanent, but to last until the next shift or turn of the wheel is required. We might also think of balance sought in the homeostatic process in terms of the basin of attraction, a scientific concept best illustrated by the traditional sure image of the boulder that is pushed up the steep grade of a hill, only to fall back down to the bottom of the valley. Similarly, when a system is perturbed, forces push it back to the balance of the basin. This is precisely what happens on an infinitesimal scale as a natural market is perturbed by changing time preferences and innovations. Drawing an example from nature and his own observations of it, Wiener compared the back-and-forth wrestling between counterbalancing forces in a system to a fight between the mongoose and cobra, which calls to mind the battle of the magpie and the serpent that legendarily inspired the creation of Taiji Kwan, though now the tables have tragically turned on the snake. Although there is no evidence that the mongoose is faster or more accurate in its motions, it almost always delivers a lethal bite to the cobra. The mongoose has his teleological, multi-stage strategy to thank, basically that of the squash or hockey player from Chapter 5. He begins with a feint, provoking the snake to strike, which the animal manages to dodge and then follow up with another feint, a rhythmical pattern of activity that develops progressively. The mongoose's moves come earlier and earlier, until finally coinciding when the snake is extended and the attack is clinched with a deadly bite to the cobra's brain. Within the mongoose's triumphant roundabout strategy lies the cybernetic strategy of steermanship. Don't over-control, don't over-grip, but rather let the system make its mistakes and then opportunistically bring it back. Wei Wu Wei. Within the economy, as Hayek stated, the mutual adjustments of individual participants occur through negative feedback. Government and central bank interventions can at best postpone the negative feedback mechanisms. They can't repeal them. Too often, however, people regard the market as a positive feedback system, which self-reinforces the continuation of a force, as in momentum, in the same direction. However, a positive feedback system is actually contrary to the way markets naturally work. In fact, they become positive feedback systems temporarily, only when they are distorted. The tendency to see only positive feedback processes and thus assume imitation-like strategies of momentum, carry, etc. A simple extrapolation of the scene is an obvious consequence of our natural shallow depth of field further compressed by the spell of artificially low rates. It may not be apparent, but a crash is ultimately a negative feedback system in action despite the proximate positive feedback route at work on a more immediate scale. Once we recognize the dominant negative feedback nature of the markets, the routes start to make sense as but a teleological means to an end. Within the cybernetic feedback loop, the detection of entropy, the amount of disorganization that exists, forces the system to maintain its structure in order to avoid a breakdown from disorder. Thus, in a natural economy, Rising interest rates are a break on roundaboutness, and bizarrely, as per the capital consumption discussed in Chapter 7, so too are artificially lowered rates. 
When rates are higher, it becomes more costly to accumulate a deeper and longer capital structure. If interest rates reflect our true time preferences and the resulting activity in the economy, this isn't a problem. The correct or natural market interest rates will, by definition, adjust to allow entrepreneurs to get through the weight of longer production only when savers really are extending their durations, as savers will offer their savings at marginally lower rates for longer periods. But when this communication is broken and rates are pushed down, independently of economic reality, in parallel shifts, and even worse, in steepening shifts. One of the consequences of lower rates is to make us exceedingly unsatisfied with waiting right now. As the lower rate is below what we intrinsically require for waiting, particularly in the immediate. Thus we are trapped into grabbing the immediate marshmallows, regardless of and ignoring relatively more abundant marshmallows off in the future. Thus the apparent paradox owing to our myopic time inconsistency from Chapter 6, that even a parallel shift of the entire yield curve downward can give more of an artificial stimulus to existing assets with a quick turnaround, such as a quick momentum trade or a quick dividend, even though normal accounting would make us think the long-term projects would see the biggest jump in demand. Disorder reigns. How Things Go Right With the Austrian school, we see how the natural market will function sans intervention, with its propensity to seek stationarity, allowing us to appreciate that the busts are a correction to counterbalance the booms, such as in the way a pressure valve finally regulates a system gone awry, as a distorted system is finally overwhelmed by the governors of savings, investment, and credit. Here we might think of the Taoist image of the surge of pent-up water, only this time it has been held back by the artificial barrier of a levee, which is breached when it can no longer control what is meant by nature to flow freely and seek balance. Hayek makes this connection and cements it strongly within Austrian theory by recognizing the cybernetic quality of economics as information is detected and acted upon. Without that dispersed knowledge, entrepreneurs have no way of knowing what the optimal deployment of resources would be. Thus the whole economic order rested on the fact that by using prices as a guide or as signals, we were led to serve the demands and enlist the powers and capacities of people of whom we know nothing, Hayek wrote. The insight needed to construct the highly configured means of production sufficient to support a growing world population comes in the form of prices. Basically, the insight that prices were signals bringing about the unforeseen coordination of the efforts of thousands of individuals was in a sense the modern cybernetics theory, and it became the leading idea behind my work. Hayek gave initial credit to Adam Smith, who had basically grasped the point that the success of our economic system was the outcome of an undesigned process coordinating the activities of a myriad of individuals. Where Smith and others left off, Hayek picked up as his responsibility to continue, trying to inform others of the wealth of information to be found in the signals within the well-functioning system that informs, albeit imperfectly. Competition is not only a discovery procedure, as Hayek termed it, but also a selection process, whereby entrepreneurs try out new strategies and profits and losses work as a cybernetic negative feedback mechanism, selecting the strategies that work and eliminating those that do not work. The Hayekian market can thus be seen as a process of phylogenetic evolution of entrepreneurial ideas, or evolution in the market. We can aptly apply Mises's notion of the market's state of rest, my way of thinking about the many routes back in the trading pit, to this Hayekian cybernetic construct. Recall from Chapter 1 the price kampf, price duel, of perpetual self-correcting balancing acts that always fail, yet are always disquieted by a striving after a definite state of rest. Each successive state of rest is the result of a self-correcting readjustment in light of new information or circumstances and in a constant environment would culminate in the ever-elusive final state of rest. Such is the entrepreneurial charge to unwittingly steer the system towards stationarity. Spontaneous Order What the Austrians, starting perhaps with Menger, and drawing upon Adam Smith before him, and fully blooming with Hayek, first referred to as spontaneous order, has steadily grown fashionable in the physical sciences, a most rare example of concepts flowing from the social to the physical sciences, starting with the guise of cybernetics and moving to complex adaptive systems, self-organization, and emergence. 
Spontaneous order may be thought of as the order that emerges from the interaction of disparate acting agents in a bottom-up dynamic that emphasizes the role of the individual, not the top-down control of, for instance, state intervention. To specifically reference this internal regulation, Hayek even coined a term, catalaxy, to replace the word economy. Thus, spontaneous order might be viewed as haphazardly designed through purposeful organization out of what appears to be highly disorganized, the order in the flock, or the ant colony, of Douglas Hofstadter, whose hidden social coordination is like that of neurons creating a coherent mind. The concept of spontaneous order takes us, once again, back to the Taoists. Mises' protege, Murray Rothbard, saw the Taoist scholar Jiang Su from the Warring States period of the 3rd and 4th centuries BCE, as embracing Lao Tzu's devotion of laissez-faire, an opposition to state rule, and credited him with being the first to articulate the idea of spontaneous order, whereby order results automatically when things are left alone, an idea that was later developed by Hayek in the 20th century. Sounding a decidedly libertarian view, Zhong Zhu, also known as Zhuang Zha, as Rothbard calls him, was perhaps the first theorist to see the state as a brigand writ large. A petty thief is put in jail. A great brigand becomes a ruler of a state. Thus, the only difference between state rulers and out-and-out -out robber chieftains is the size of their depredations. Spontaneous order is interrupted, and as we have seen, often perilously, by top-down control from intervention to full-on socialism. In a system as complex as the market, such attempts at outside artificial control are doomed to fail. As we know, roundabout production requires the ambiguous and uncertain focus on a future advantage, sure. However, the distortions of interventionism paradoxically morph that into a focus on quick and decisive outcomes, Lee. Distortion As we can see, distortion is not merely a byproduct of growth in the economy. Rather, and most important for our discussion, it is a monetary phenomenon. Specifically, the Austrians blame the business cycle on government protection of artificial credit expansion, which reaches its zenith with central banking, but existed even before the Fed, created in 1913. Those who criticize ABCT based on this 1913 birth date of the Fed miss the nuances of past monetary-based credit booms. Rothbard's doctoral dissertation on this matter focused on the Panic of 1819. Even the infamous Tulip Mania of 1630 considered the greatest bubble in history, when Hollanders were gripped in a craze of speculation over tulip bulbs, was caused by monetary distortion, even though there was no central bank behind the scenes. At the time, the Netherlands had a free coinage policy that allowed those who had silver and gold bullion from the Americas to mint their own coins. By 1630, a large increase in the supply of coins and bullion in Amsterdam far exceeded the market demand and led to malinvestment and speculation. The market movement in tulips, therefore, was not caused by mere waves of emotion that produced a mania. Mistaking the cause for the effect, it was rather an increase in the supply of money that prompted a massive, though highly localized, asset inflation right out of the land of the Nibelungen. We thus plant a stake in the ground of understanding of economics and the functioning of markets, that the former view of randomness invokes state inventions, whereas the natural teleological ebb and flow defers to the homeostatic process. To clarify my view, we can contrast it with that of the American economist Hyman Minsky, who tried to lay blame for the boom and bust cycle on leverage. Simply stated, he believed that as the market goes up for an extended period of time without any corrections, the total leverage in the financial sector gradually increases, making the system ever more tenuous. Although Minsky's narrative is acceptable as a description of certain features of the business cycle, he doesn't really give an explanation for the phenomenon. In contrast, the Austrians give a much more satisfactory theory of how artificially low interest rates foster an unsustainable boom. Characterized by over-leveraged borrowers invested in operating capital, that will be unproductive at natural interest rates, and the inevitable bust. This aspect of Minsky's view, the inherent instability and unpredictability of the crash, is one of its virtues in the eyes of his Keynesian admirers. Indeed, there are two major trends in Keynesian thought, both descended from different themes in John Maynard Keynes's 1936 work. On the one hand, there was the straightforward, 
deterministic system of aggregate demand and involuntary unemployment, the stuff of textbooks. At the same time, Keynes's prose contained passages describing the utter unpredictability of the market, in particular asset pricing. Here entered the famous animal spirits and Keynes's likening of the stock market to a casino and a game in which contestants had to vote on general opinion, not on what the underlying reality was. In this latter worldview, Minsky's vague treatment of the boom and bust is proper, since there really aren't demonstrable causes in the way many economists would like to believe, and as I talk about in Chapter 9. The Sandpile Effect Minsky's belief that the leveraged run-up is the underlying cause of crashes is similar to the notion of self-organized criticality in a dynamical system, the classic metaphor of which is the sandpile effect. Grain by grain, the pile gets higher until it is of considerable height, and at some point will reach a critical state where just one more grain will cause a cascading collapse, an avalanche of sorts, the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. This basic cellular automata model has similarly been applied to forest fire models and to stock market crashes, with exceedingly limited success. Indeed, it has become fashionable to look at crashes as critical system-wide landslides. However, these and Minsky's analyses miss the mark. The homeostatic market process must first be broken by intervention from outside the system in order for it to fail. Specifically, criticality is not an inherent epiphenomenon of the system, growing organically as a delicate cascading network from within. Rather, it grows from unhealthy sprouts doomed at their start from a temporary deception, a miscommunication and failure of control within the cybernetic machine. In the popular financial jargon, a Minsky moment now refers to a sudden collapse in asset values following a leveraged run-up during a period of apparent prosperity. To repeat, this description is consistent with the Austrian theory of the business cycle, but it leaves major questions unanswered. Why should the market's normal negative feedback mechanism suddenly fail? Sure, individual entrepreneurs can make mistakes, but what explains the systematic mistakes of the boom years, the cluster of errors, as Rothbard calls them? The leading theoretical argument for the supposed efficacy of the various rounds of quantitative easing is the so-called wealth effect, meaning that consumers go out and spend more because they feel richer when their assets stock portfolios, houses, etc., rise in price relative to consumer prices. It would be difficult to come up with an economic policy more at odds with Austrian capital theory, printing up new money in order to convince people that they can consume more based on their immediate asset appreciation, and never mind what happens once the cost of capital inevitability returns to normal and the economy and MS index return to stationarity. If the Austrians can dispense with the idea of animal spirits and Minsky moments as explanatory devices, they can also jettison another Keynesian nostrum, the so-called paradox of thrift, in which the individual households do the rational thing by attempting to save more in light of a financial setback. Yet when aggregated over the whole economy, the motive becomes self-defeating since one household's spending is another household's income. According to textbook Keynesian theory, the paradox of thrift shows the role for government deficit spending to escape a slump when the homeostatic mechanism of the market has failed. Here again, a focus on Austrian capital theory as opposed to Keynesian income flows shows the problem. A recession isn't simply some stroke of dumb luck in which people have failed to spend enough. It is characterized by physical distortions in the structure of production. Racking up more government debt is hardly the cure to inadequate saving and physical investment. No matter how noble such measures might sound on their own, particularly in the bloody aftermath of a crisis, as if the government were handing out tourniquets, these interventionist actions, like the fire suppression in the forest, only prolong the problem and postpone the restoration of health to the forest. Distortion persists, leaving a wide swath of destruction in its wake, but ultimately it does not prevail. Distortion's message, do nothing. Generations of economists teach us that the market economy, like many other spontaneous self-regulating systems found both in nature and the social world, has an internal logic. When it moves away from a stationary point, negative feedback automatically kicks in, restoring it to a balanced state. Whether we describe it as Adam Smith's invisible hand 
or as Mises's counterbalancing of entrepreneurial forces, or we take Hayek's cue and employ the concepts of cybernetics, the crucial fact is that there are underlying laws governing the operation of the market, steering it back toward an orderly trajectory whenever it is disrupted. Left to its own natural development, the market will hit bumps in the road. Yet paradoxically, the paternalistic effort to spare us the pain of these periodic readjustments will, at best, merely postpone the needed fixes, making the ultimate crisis that much worse. To avoid economic depressions, just as to avoid epic forest fires, the surprising solution is to let the homeostatic system work. Don't just do something, sit there. In the meantime, when the economy is subject to top-down intervention from the government, and especially the central bank, investors need to read the signs in order to protect themselves, as well as still find a way to own productive assets, as the last two chapters show in Austrian investing, with our hero Siegfried becoming our mascot and model. After all, civilization's progress, Galt's engines of the world, mustn't end, believing that homeostasis will indeed prevail. We are steadfast in our pursuit of the roundabout. The Sure of Capital The masters have taught us well, if only we will heed the lessons. From ancient Taoist philosophers to military strategists, an old grain trader at the Chicago Board of Trade, Austrian economists, and roundabout entrepreneurs, they have bridged their unique backgrounds with a common refrain that echoes in a single word, sure, with its complex and multiple meanings of strategic positional advantage, potential, disposition, configuration, influence, and propensity. As we orient everything to sure, we automatically keep to the roundabout path, refusing to be led astray by distorted perceptions in a world that focuses only on today, as if it is all that matters, indeed all there is. To embrace the Tao of capital, we purposefully and intentionally raise our sights and deepen our field of focus to see that today is but one unit, a single bead in a long strand. We refuse the blinders of myopic time inconsistency, while being well aware that much of the world can see only this way. Ours, though, is the intertemporal view, a never-ending series of now moments, each connected to the next, that extend throughout our lifetime and beyond it as well. For courage and example, we look to our array of sure masters who were able to wait with the cunning patience of the manipulative sage to accrue strategic advantage. Oh, these masters knew all too well how hard it was to embrace the doing-not-doing doing of Wei Wu Wei. Patience as self-inflicted agony, while letting one's opponent gloat over racked-up points and small victories in the moment. The master's feints of humility must have felt very much at times like humiliation, but the reward of being purposefully and intentionally circuitous, to be sure until strategic advantage coalesces into the opportunistic action of Lee within sure, can be found in the single pine cone, loaded with seeds for dispersal on fire-cleared land, the loaded crossbow trained at last on the intended target, and the accumulation of productive capital to advance material society. We take heart in Eugen von Bermbawerk's words about the roundabout, which we now apply to the imperative of being sure. It is so much the better that it is often the only way. If this lesson has not been learned as yet, then please, do so now, for it will serve you well as we move on to Austrian investing one and two. Without this understanding, chapters nine and ten will do you no good. In sure, and the synonymous roundabout and umvig, we can also find the continual workings of homeostasis and the return to the equilibrium known as stationarity. Perpetual reversion is the way of the world. No matter how distortion subverts the natural process, in the end it cannot be prevented. As the Lao Tzu reminds us, we can witness their reversion. Things proliferate, and each again returns to its root. Returning to the root is called equilibrium. Now as for equilibrium, this is called returning to the propensity of things. Thus, in the propensity of things, a seminal meaning of sure, we also find the Taoist definition for returning to equilibrium, homeostasis, or in Austrian terms, stationarity. To the great masters who have come before us, we owe a tremendous debt, for they have left us a treasure trove of wisdom compressed into a diamond of great value, sure, the roundabout, the return of homeostasis. This is our touchstone, that is, if we choose to use it. Fortunately, in our quest to be sure in a Lee world, we have prototypes and guides to follow.
we have the sure of Clip, with his paradoxical loving to lose and hating to win, and of the military strategists Sun Tzu and Karl von Clausewitz, who found the greater valor in the intermediate zeal as the middle means for achieving the desired outcome of the end goal of Zweck, and without the carnage of the head-on clash. In Friedrich Bastiat, we know better than to follow the bad economist, now our arch-nemesis, who sees only the small apparent good while ignoring the greater evil to come, that which is unseen by the myopic, but should be foreseen by those who know to look. On the roundabout, we have the real-world example of Henry Ford, who eschewed the quick profits of today and patiently invested in a more circuitous process, so that with stopwatch in hand he might be highly impatient with greater efficiency in his production later. And there are the mythical entrepreneurs as well, starting with that shipwrecked savage Robinson Crusoe in his lowly economy of one, hungry today but hungrily catching all the more fish tomorrow. And in economics as a Wagnerian epic, we have Siegfried, the entrepreneurial hero of Nibelungenland, who evades the evil in the form of the magic potion of distortion that seeks to turn him into his opposite and force him unwittingly to betray his entrepreneurial oath of sure. Like Siegfried, we will be confronted with temptations that could lead us into all sorts of evils, from leverage to blithely following the positive feedback crowd into the illusion of distorted assets. Our sword and our shield against such foes have been forged by the Austrians, Menger, who defeated the historicists and their slavish attachment to empirical data, Bambavirk, who quelled the Marxists by proving the end product justified the value of its means, not the other way around, and Mises, who bashed the Keynesians, though they were too self-absorbed to notice, with the unavoidable truth about distortion that torches a destructive path across the economy, felling good trees and bad. Now, at this juncture, the philosophical part of our journey comes to an end. Next, we move to the pragmatic application of what we have learned in Austrian Investing 1 and 2, the subject of chapters 9 and 10. Before we move on, we face our moment of truth, when we must stand up as true believers in this gospel of Austrian theory, which in its attempts to explain the entire boom-bust cycle gives us a coherent story that ties all the pieces together. As we move from theory to practice, the first eight chapters of this audiobook to the last two, we will utilize what I have dubbed the MS Index and the Faustman Ratio, as well as Siegfried, the roundabout entrepreneur, the embodiments of all the principles that have come before. When the MS Index diverges from one, unnaturally because returns on capital exceed the cost of capital, and myopic time inconsistency plus monetary distortion traps everyone else into chasing immediate returns, you do not have to follow the ill-fated crowd. More generally, you needn't chase the immediately seen over what should be foreseen. You can let those who listen to the siren song of Lee be dashed on the rocks of their own impatience. You can stay true to Sure, the roundabout, in its various guises, and wait for the return of homeostasis that will prevail even in the midst of pervasive distortion. Indeed, you can become the hero of your own roundabout investing story, by avoiding the distortion and thus having all the more resources later for opportunistic investing. It is your path and your choice. If you choose well, it will become your Tao of capital. Chapter 9 Austrian Investing 1 The Eagle and the Swan Exploiting the Distortion with Musician Tools Having followed the vast, varied, and often ancient lineage of the roundabout strategy to its central economic role in the orthodoxy of the Austrian school, we are now prepared to apply the principles of the roundabout, Wu Wei, Schur, Umweg, to capitalistic investing. We have reached the end of sorts, a practical and tangible conclusion of following our well-developed roundabout path in the effective deployment of capital. We have indeed turned a corner in the Tao of capital, as we begin here a new discussion of an approach I call Austrian investing. My intention in this chapter, far more important than any action step and exceedingly more useful, is to affirm a way of thinking as introduced in the preceding chapters, to plainly recognize when distortion exists, and to assess one's attitude and appetite when it comes to that distortion. We ask ourselves, how are we exposed to malinvestment? Are we, for instance, investing in what is most manipulated by? whose profitability is most dependent upon artificially low interest rates? Beyond avoiding it, 
Can we perhaps even benefit from it? If this audiobook achieves nothing else, it would more than hit its mark if listeners came away with greater awareness of such distortions in the economy and the markets, which magnify the human tendency toward the direct reward of Lee, and acquired a deeper appreciation for the arduous path of Schur. The thought process here is what matters most. It is the real takeaway, a prescription for all investors, as it culminates the overarching theme of this audiobook. The roundabout of the Tao of capital as the circuitous means toward the ends of productive capital investment, despite our biology and a system rigged against it. In this chapter, what has previously been an a priori praxeological understanding becomes a historical understanding as it turns from thought to action. Yet we stay true to the very path prescribed in the methodological roots of preceding chapters. The great thinkers from Lao Tzu to Bastiat, Menger to Mises, from the deductive to the inductive, from methodological individualism to the flock, developing logical constructions of human action that then conform to how we understand the day-to-day -day world. They taught us that much of the visible is a distraction from a hidden reality, cautioning us not to learn from and thus be fooled by data, and moreover by what comes first, the seen. Theirs are the simple insights for the foreseen. They taught us of the multidimensionality of the world, the cross-currents obscuring cause and effect. We do not experience the governing forces. The study of economic history, Mises said, was a laudable thing, but the results of such studies should not be confused with the study of economics. Studying economic history does not produce facts in the sense in which this term is applied with regard to the events tested in laboratory experiments. It does not deliver bricks for the construction of a posteriori hypotheses and theorems. Thus, in true Austrian style, in their early battles with the German historical school, we start by thinking through our task, having embraced the principles and adopted the theories that guide our thinking. Only then are we ready to take a peek at the data, and we will still feel a bit sullied after having done so. First and foremost, this exercise is about restraint. I focus only on what matters and is worthy of testing, and include here the results of each of my scanty tests none left on the factory floor, each one serving to further validate a thought process rather than the other way around. For me, when testing these investment results and properties, I insist on keeping the empirical work short and sweet, such that the clock is always ticking and is thus curbing the all-too-easy and common slide into a useless backfitting exercise. I'm reminded of the roundaboutness of Henry Ford, for whom years of developing methods and constructing tools were followed by only minutes in production, sometimes reduced to seconds. The former were the means to the latter. Here, years of introspection and preparation for what became Austrian investing are followed by mere minutes of data processing. The difference between the Austrian approach here and what is otherwise standard in the empirical sciences, economics and finance quite erroneously considered among them, is that without our understanding developed thus far, none of the testing that follows would have any merit whatsoever. Moreover, I would even consider our understanding valid no matter what the data show, such as the dilemma of economic science. Homeostasis in Force The simple insight that the market is a natural homeostatic self-correcting mechanism and that monetary distortion results only in a temporary disruption of that mechanism portends some results. From this, what do we expect to see, not require, but expect? Let's take a step back and survey what we really know. Since the Misesian stationarity index can reach a lofty level, meaning the economy can persistently deviate from stationarity, only because of monetary distortion, we should expect a very high MS index to act as a prelude to a price of title to existing capital. The stock market, the numerator in the MS index, that is unsustainably high. This follows our expectation that the replacement value of that capital, the denominator in the MS index, will be unresponsive as further new investment is thwarted by the distortion. Savers and investors, dissatisfied with artificially low interest rates that don't reflect their actual time preferences, placate themselves by eking out yield and otherwise chasing immediate returns which are themselves given a boost from higher immediate consumption and lower savings from artificially lower rates. They quickly devour the immediate marshmallow in front of them, scoffing at the potential rewards for waiting. 
The lower rates make otherwise marginal investment schemes look good, and otherwise marginal existing capital, having marginal returns, look suddenly profitable, resulting in a scramble to own it and resulting in persistent market maladjustments. The system becomes starved of capital for roundabout production, as capital is trapped in the present, consuming itself, as it were, and thus there are insufficient resources to support the ongoing illusion of economic progress. It only stands to reason that the stock market should inevitably fall, and fall in a violent, concentrated manner, as investors are routed into immediate liquidation altogether. Existing capital is priced too high relative to its ultimate profitability, and all the monetary delusions of grandeur are simultaneously revealed in a burst of highly correlated entrepreneurial error, when, in Mises's words, the airy castle of the boom can no longer buttress itself, and either rates rise from higher factor prices or from exhausted credit, it collapses on itself in a mass liquidation of malinvestment, a stock market crash, the homeostatic process in force. An auspicious and cathartic rout of malinvestment should then eventually produce an exceedingly low MS index, as the fire sale prices of titles to existing capital become unsustainably low. Capital will again begin its journey toward productive use, and its pricing is reorganized by the markets as they move back toward stationarity. Savings will necessarily grow again as rates finally reflect true time preferences, balancing the desire for and timing of roundabout investment, and immediate consumption will fall. The grand homeostasis reigns. Here we have the comprehensive Austrian setup for the ubiquitous violent twists and turns of the stock market and the economy. The events that the authorities and masterminds of the day always see as the unfortunate effects of hazardous and haphazard market forces, what have come to be routinely, though erringly called, black swans. And this is our setup for Austrian Investing One, whereby we swoop down like Sun Tzu's bird of prey, or better yet the Austrian eagle, when the moment is ripe and from a strategic position of advantage and exploit these otherwise unexpected booms and busts. Witness to the Distortion Now for some housekeeping. As discussed in Chapter 7, the MS Index is very well represented by what is known as the Tobin's Equity Q Ratio, total U.S. corporate equity divided by total U.S. corporate net worth, which is readily available online through numerous sources and easily computable using Federal Reserve Flow of Funds balance sheet data. And it is the height of irony that the very institution at the root of the distortion the recognition of which is the point of the MS index, provides the data necessary to calculate it. Figure 9.1 in the downloadable PDF shows the history of the MS index going back to 1901. I have scaled it by its running geometric average, meaning it averages only data available as of each date, and thus removes any ex-post information. This scaling is meant to smooth any historical balance sheet bias. While we see a regular and orderly mean reverting line cycling through history, the story it fails to tell, I might add, is the human misery and tumult and otherwise break on civilization's march suffered over the deep credit cycles displayed. This history depicts the clear footprints of historical monetary distortion. I regard it as pseudo-evidence of Austrian business cycle theory, ABCT, as academics struggle with empirically proving a misnomer to be sure, ABCT, I argue they have simply been looking in the wrong places. The first obvious question to ask is what is the subsequent effect of this distortion on the replacement value of all the capital valued in the numerator? That is, to what extent have higher expected profits in the price of title to existing capital been subsequently imputed into the source of those higher profits? Shouldn't high MS index levels above one, for instance, logically lure profit-seeking entrepreneurs into greater capital investment, such that their successive efforts raise the replacement value and accumulated magnitude in the denominator and thus offset the rise in the numerator of the MS index? In fact, there is absolutely no statistically significant or consistent relationship between MS index levels and subsequent aggregate capital investment, visible neither in changes in aggregate capital expenditures as a percentage of invested capital nor in changes in aggregate corporate net worth, the denominator of the MS index. Much to the chagrin of the meddling central bankers, only the stock market is reliably affected, and only for a time, by monetary interventionism. In other words, when the central bankers try to stimulate actual physical investment by goosing asset prices with loose money, 
they failed to achieve their goal. The result puzzled Tobin and other Keynesians, as mentioned in Chapter 7, and might have even surprised Mises somewhat before applying his entirely correct theory of malinvestment to Bombavirk's earlier insight on myopic time inconsistency and to real-world interest rates. Any alternative explanation for this history of the MS Index, such as the existence of psychological animal spirits driving economic booms and busts, must explain how this irrationality applies only to the stock market, but not to its components, that is, only to the whole, but not to the sum of its parts. How are equity holders, the owners of capital, the factors of production, specifically and highly segmented from those who further build new capital, new factors of production? This is a far more dubious proposition than simply saying that assets are expensive, as apparently only certain assets are expensive. The next and most pertinent question, what is the real effect of this distortion on the numerator? The aggregate land expectation value, if this were taking place in our Nibelungenland, and the aggregate stock market capitalization in our real economy. Let's start by examining the total excess returns, the return including dividends, in excess of the one-year risk-free treasury rate of the S&P Composite Index, the biggest, most closely watched, and most heavily traded and well-recorded capitalization-weighted U.S. stock index, a very good proxy for the total corporate equity of the MS Index, following different regimes of monetary distortion since the turn of the 20th century. I throw each annual return data point on the S&P Composite into one or four brackets based on the MS Index at the start of each one-year period. In Figure 9.1 of the downloadable PDF, the first bucket, on the far left, corresponds to the lowest quartile, or lowest 25%, MS Index readings, the second for the next higher readings, the third for the next, and finally the fourth bucket, on the far right, for the highest quartile MS Index readings. I then take the average of the excess returns in each bucket to see simple expectations for each MS Index level. All returns are total excess returns, including dividends. The error ranges around each bar, depicted by the vertical lines with hash marks at each end, are 95% confidence intervals of the sample statistics, found through a non-parametric bootstrap. This same methodology is used throughout this and the next chapter. Based on what we now know, we could expect to see an inverse relationship. When the MS index is low, the subsequent average stock return should be high. When the MS index is high, the subsequent average return should be low. If we didn't observe this outcome, it would mean that somehow investors responded to lower rates with more new capital investment, and this new investment, as well as the old, remained, on average, profitable after rates normalized, an impossibility. The data cooperate with greater than 95% statistical significance, my conjecture, derived from Austrian theory, is right. What's driving these return differentials? Do stocks merely drift up at steeper rates under low MS index levels than under high ones? Or is there something else going on? Of course, we would expect to see the indications of severe malinvestment liquidation driving these results, meaning severe subsequent stock market losses. And we'll look at the concentration or speed of such losses a bit later. In the following test, I use S&P Composite Index drawdowns or the amount by which our S&P returns cumulatively turn negative during any three-year window before rising again, as a measurement of stock market losses. In bucketing these drawdowns based on the MS index at the start of each period, just as I did in Figure 9.2 of the downloadable PDF, we start to uncover the market's dynamics. In Figure 9.3 of the downloadable PDF, the lowest dark bar indicates the 20th percentile drawdown, or the realized drawdown at which 20% of all the data in the bucket are lower, and the light bar above the dark bar is the 50th percentile, also called the median drawdown, or the realized drawdown at which half of all the data in the bucket are lower. Error bars indicate 95% confidence intervals around each percentile estimate. Going back over a century, this looks pretty bad for capital investment following high MS index levels. And for low MS index levels, there really wasn't much to worry about. Imagine that. What a financially distorted world tells us is that the market, just like the overgrown forest, carries within it the seeds of its destructive correction. Thus, the inevitable bust that follows the boom is not, or at least should not be, an unexpected event. This is a very important realization, 
something of a death blow to the concept of systemic risk, and which will become the backbone of the Austrian investing one rationale, and without which we would be left as mere victims of the distorted market and seemingly random shocks. The Austrians were right before the time of this data, just as we saw in Nibelungenland in Chapter 7, the undulations of the business cycle, as reflected in the stock market, do indeed simply follow a pattern of correcting persistent inflationary departures from stationarity. An Initial Misesian Investment Strategy What would the assumption of the validity of this simple idea have done for an investor in the U.S. back when the Austrians first formulated the principles behind it, starting 100 or so years ago? Let's put this to the test, a tremendous century-long out-of-sample test, truly free of hindsight bias, of the deductive a priori Austrian capital and interest theory. Let's consider what one might do with just this robust information on the existence and effects of distortion, for which, obviously, we didn't really need the tests presented earlier. Let's become greedy capitalists, licking our chops, crossbows drawn, and wondering how we can make money from this knowledge. To start, the simplest back-of-the-envelope strategy would be to buy when the MS index is low and sell when it is high. I'll call this our musician investment strategy, in honor of the man whose approach was to avoid the systematic collapse of the 1930s. A version of this strategy has, of course, been identified by others before, and what investment strategy hasn't? What matters here is the conceptual thinking, the identification of the edge, or, in this case, the imbalance behind the strategy. Here we are playing the explicit role of our pedagogical conifer, anticipating and exploiting through circumvention the roiling wildfire and resulting nutrient-rich soil. A quick and dirty scan of the MS index chart, figure 9.1 in the downloadable PDF, tells us that, say, a reading of 1.6 and, say, of 0 0.7, were historically generally high and low levels, so likely good places to sell and buy stocks, respectively. And when we've sold out of our stocks, we buy one-month treasury bills and roll them each month until we buy back into the stock market. How would that have done? There is a good deal of ex-post information in this strategy, because we didn't know what constituted a good MS index level at which to sell or buy until it was all over, of course. However, it turns out, not surprisingly, that's not a concern. If I instead start my test after, say, 1925, the first complete cycle, rather than 1901, and use only the information known at the time from then on, I get equivalent results. No cheating. As my old mentor Everett Clipp would have advised, our methodology here is exceedingly simple, again dubiously so. But there is great beauty and effectiveness in our simplicity. See figure 9.4 of the downloadable PDF. The musician strategy outperforms the stock market by more than two percentage points per year. Think about what this shows. A basic toy strategy with an alpha T-score of well over four, based solely on an easily calculatable and logical measure of market distortion, beats not only the average professional stock picker, who consistently underperforms the S&P, but also the highly survivorship-biased average hedge fund manager such as from the HFRI fund Weighted Composite Index, and with far less fanfare and risk. And for the record, while others have made attempts at Austrian market indicators of all sorts, none to my knowledge has either had these results nor avoided the lures of arbitrary ex-post fitting and spurious relationships. The properties of the MS Index offer a logical, straightforward, and highly pragmatic guide that most people can follow and understand. Acting is a very simple gauge to judge one's investment theses. And yet, it still seems to elude most people. After all, very few people, including professionals, get these kinds of investing results over time. The reason, as you've probably deduced by now, is that these returns are only realized in an exceedingly roundabout way. The detour beats the direct route. That is, it takes the musician strategy's average underperformance duration and magnitude of almost three years and 9% annualized to gain the advantages of investing for its eventual 2% cumulative outperformance. Just imagine still waiting today after two decades to re-enter the once again booming stock market. It painfully sacrifices immediate profits as markets become more and more inflated by artificially low rates most of the time for a tremendous eventual advantage in buying after they inevitably deflate. 
It is investing, Wei Qi style. In the immediate marshmallow world of investing, it is so hard to be the one sitting with folded arms, not taking the sweet enticement of now, and focusing instead on intermediate means for positional advantage to be exploited later. In Wei Qi, it takes great discipline to be sure, building only potential that may or may not ever really materialize, while one's Li opponent racks up points and appears to be winning by a sizable margin. Yet it is a choice that we must make to take on the roundabout burden of the indirect, retreating now and looking foolish or worse to the rest of the world. Clip used to have a pithy phrase that embodied the difficulty of being sure in a Lee world, saying to be successful in trading, one had to look like a jerk, feel like a jerk. Though, what else would we expect from the man who said you had to love to lose money and hate to make it? Given all the time we've spent in the esteemed company of Lao Tsa and Sun Tzu, Bastiat and Clausewitz, Menger, Bombaverk, Mises and Ford, why would we not want to apply this thinking for ourselves? Not to do so would seem the ultimate foolishness to turn our back on this archetypal strategic wisdom. If you are wondering right now after eight chapters of the roundabout, if the first investment strategy you are receiving basically tells you to stay out of the market for long periods of time when distortion is running high, the answer is yes. Although that may seem anticlimactic, it is anything but. To put this in the most straightforward terms, it's a really big deal, a very different and contrarian and highly effective way to approach investing. Just as Clip's paradox of love to lose money, hate to make money, led to incredible discipline and some healthy returns in the trading pit, so too does this musician approach in anyone's portfolio. The objective of roundabout Austrian investing is not to find a way to make money now, but to position ourselves for better investment opportunities later, or as we might state it, we're being patient now, so we can be strategically impatient later. Whatever you decide to do as an investor, keep in mind the overarching aim of this audiobook. It is about a way of thinking, of understanding the roundabout and the considerable strategic advantages to be gained along the patient, circuitous path. If you take away nothing else from this chapter, or even from this audiobook, Know that there is usually imminent danger in the direct approach, in ignoring the means for the ends, particularly in the market when distortion is running high. Thanks to the Musician Stationarity Index, there is a way to gauge that danger so that, no matter what your investment decisions are, you are better informed about those dangers. Implementing this cookie-cutter Musician strategy is extremely ambitious, even audacious, particularly for professionals, as Chapter 6 reminds us because of that humanness about us that gives us a high immediate time preference, further magnified under monetary intervention, and makes it difficult to impossible to forego the immediate marshmallow, even though we may believe there are a great many more marshmallows to come. Think of the musician Wall Street investor, an oddity to be sure, who shows no excess return during the distortion years when he owns low-yielding T-bills and dramatically underperforms the stock market as it further runs up. He and his ilk would have mostly been weeded out by natural selection over a year or two of underperformance. No uber-hyperbolic discounter will ever get to monetize the 2% outperformance of the musician strategy, though he would be a wealthy star if he could. Hyperbolic discounting requires enduring a difficult wait, which is most intense in the earliest steps, from today until tomorrow, from tomorrow to the day after, and so forth. We perceive that the weight will get easier with each step, but that doesn't help us over the next step, particularly if interest rates have been manipulated all the way down to zero and everyone is piling into the stock market. As stated earlier, our sense of immediacy is made all the more acute, paradoxically, by monetary distortion, feeding an ever-shortening investment horizon. If everyone could steel themselves against the temptation brought on by the distortion, or if humans were robotic exponential discounters, and all capital were the same homogeneous blob, then distortion likely wouldn't even happen. To succeed, we need the fortitude of Mises, who turned down a lucrative job with the prestigious Kreditenstalt Bank, saying he wouldn't be part of the great crash to come. We too need to distance ourselves from the distortion, so that we do not become suckered in by it, which will lead to the opposite of what we intend buying when the MS index is high and selling as it falls, which, rather than the roundabout path to capital accumulation, is the direct path to capital destruction. 
There is yet another challenge in executing this musician strategy. It requires contrarian thinking, a not-to-be-underestimated psychological feat to zig when the rest of the world is zagging, to step aside when the rest of the world is scrambling to buy, and to buy when the rest of the world is bailing out of positions. When the MS index goes so low it falls well below one, then one can act like a corporate raider, particularly common around the last generational low in the MS index in the early 1980s, scooping up good assets that can then be liquidated at a profit, because in the aftermath of a malinvestment purge, title to capital is available for less than the replacement cost. Think of a low MS index for a cash-rich investor as an analogous to the no longer dormant conifer seeds after their serotonous cones have opened, ready to spread throughout the fire-cleared, competitor-free land, enriched by nutrients of their vanquished predecessors. The Eagle and the Swan The sudden realization of mass-correlated entrepreneurial error is Austrian-speak for stock market crash as most, if not all, companies suddenly are revealed to have been priced wrong, and many are engaged in, and now looking to quickly exit, projects that one minute were considered profitable and the next not. This is, of course, the retreating route, to be followed by the counter route. How can this happen outside of the distortion described in Nibelungenland? Everyone continues to scratch their heads over this. Many are quick to become financial ornithologists, crying black swan, as per Nassim Taleb's wonderful book by the same name. A black swan, or tail event, is an epical event, big and extremely rare, or better still, has never yet even happened at all. The word tail refers to the outermost and relatively thin tail-like appendage of a frequency distribution, or probability density function. The first and second century CE Roman poet Juvenal is credited with coining the term black swan in reference to a decent wife, a rare bird, as strange to the earth as a black swan. Any spousal ire over that comment should be directed at Juvenal, not at this author. Black swan, as the code words for an unexpected event, the discovery that not all swans were white as once believed, was promulgated in the early 20th century by Viennese-born philosopher Karl Popper, who taught at the London School of Economics. Popper and rival Ludwig Wittgenstein who famously argued over sundry philosophical problems, were major forces in the intellectual prowess of early 20th century Vienna. When they occur, stock market crashes seem so irrational to most, so haphazard and unforeseeable, so black swan. But are they irrational? Are they even unforeseeable? Or do they simply stem from the distorting effects of credit expansions, as the Austrians suggest? We have already seen, in Figure 9.3 of the downloadable PDF, that severe stock market losses, what I've called drawdowns, follow periods of great distortion. While accumulated losses are likely the only crashes that matter, after all, it is the extent to which stock market losses accumulate that they are economically important. Let's nonetheless take this a step further and look at temporally concentrated stock market losses, those that occur over a month, for instance, selling routes. I'll actually use two-month returns in order to best capture non-calendar monthly swings. These should be the true mark of a distorted world, since the end to the distortion is a sudden revelation as interest rates rise or credit evaporates, not a slow, orderly correction. If it were the latter, it would presumably be correctable through ordinary entrepreneurial adjustments. Over the past century plus, there have been sizable monthly losses of 20% or more, in the aggregate U.S. stock market, and they have occurred with exceedingly low frequency. By definition, therefore, it would seem we should be able to call such crashes in the stock market tail events. But on closer inspection, a different story emerges in Figure 9.5 of the downloadable PDF. Upon bucketing two-month returns by their starting MS index quartiles, over a three-year window of overlapping two-month returns following bucketing, and calculating the second and fifth percentiles in each bucket, we see again that crashes follow distortion. This is just as was done in Figure 9.3 of the downloadable PDF, with 20th and 50th percentiles of all the cumulative drawdowns. Only here I'm looking at second and fifth percentiles of all the two-month returns, meaning in the case of the second percentile, the realized two-month return at which 2% 2 of all the two-month return data in the bucket are lower. Error bars once again indicate 95% confidence intervals around each percentile estimate, 
To put figure 9.5 in the downloadable PDF into perspective, with 2% of two-month returns having been even worse than a 20% crash during the high MS index quartile, the lowest dark bar in the fourth bucket on the far right, one could expect to wait around 50 months as the expected number of random trials needed to get an outcome with a 2% chance on each trial for a greater than 20% two-month crash to occur when the MS index is in this highest of ranges. Clearly, 20% or worse crashes are not the random 100-year flood as people generally think. They happen fairly quickly under certain conditions, a very distorted MS index, while those conditions have happened a handful of times over the past century, moreover, they happen much less quickly, and one would in fact still be waiting, following a low MS index. Once again, with such sound Austrian logic behind these studies, the evidence of distortion and its ramifications to investors is overwhelming. When the MS index is high ex ante, subsequent large stock market losses and crashes are no longer tail events at all. Rather, they are perfectly expected events. To Austrian eyes, these epical losses were not unforeseeable. More alarmingly, due to the evidence of monetary credit expansion of late, visible in the MS index in figure 9.1 of the downloadable PDF, as of this writing in July 2013, we have no right to be surprised by a severe and imminent stock market crash. In fact, we must absolutely expect it. For the record, our discussion of black swans here is confined to events as registered by the stock market. Should an asteroid come hurtling at us from the depths of space and strike us unawares, then maybe we'll chalk that one up to a black swan. However, stock market plunges that have occurred over the past century most certainly were not black swans or tail events. When it comes to events such as the crash of 2008, we see instead a bird of a very different feather, the Austrian variety. What we have here is an induction problem of vantage point, such as Bertrand Russell's chicken that is surprised to have its neck wrung by the very farmer who has been lovingly feeding it all of its life. The common epistemological problem is failing to account for the possibility of a tail until we see it. But the challenge here is something of the reverse. We account for visible tails unconditionally, and thus fail to account for when such a tail is not even a tail at all. Perhaps the scientific and mathematical methodology, the physics envy of Chapter 7, of modern economics and finance, is at the very source of the perception problem. A mainstream economist will typically model stock price movements such that a tail event, by definition, is bad luck. Every serious student of mathematics and finance recognizes the naive simplicity of the Gaussian bell curve, loosely speaking, assumptions underlying standard economics and finance models of the markets. But I am claiming here that the solution is not to come up with even fancier probability distributions. The deeper problem is the treatment of the return in the market as a number given to us by capricious nature. Despite the apparent tremendous uncertainty in stock returns, they are most certainly not randomly generated numbers. Understanding tales would be tricky matters if they were, as we know from the deceptive small sample bias of power law distributions, for instance. Stock markets, however, are so much richer, grittier, and more complex than that. Why shouldn't the price of immediacy jump to infinity along with perceived demands for immediacy? Why should anyone be expected to accommodate a burst of counterparties at prices that are strongly and suddenly believed to be in error, to accommodate the liquidation of malinvestment? After all, to assume anything else would be to assume that liquidity providers are charities. The black swan notion is still paramount, however. I named many of my investment partnerships after it, but only because of the vantage point perception problem. Truly, the real black swan problem of stock market busts is not about a remote event that is considered unforeseeable. Rather, it is about a foreseeable event that is considered remote. The vast majority of market participants fail to expect what should be, in reality, perfectly expected events. Intertemporally challenged and further blinded by a myopic focus on the now, they price in only Anglo swans, missing the Viennese bird lurking conspicuously in the weeds. Case Study Prototypical Tail Hedging We are now ready to transition from the simple musician investing strategy to Austrian Investing 1. In so doing, we return, in essence, to Marco at Miguelagat's pool. 
although his gear to catch thingamajiggers has been upgraded considerably to highly sophisticated harpoons. Put options in our case. In the second phase, Austrian Investing II, we switch from Marco to Siegfried, that intrepid Wagnerian dragon slayer and Nibelungen entrepreneur, whose activities are less susceptible to distortion, and who represents the true advantage of the roundabout. When distortions and imbalances in the aggregate capital structure come to an end, by necessity, it happens so ferociously, due to the surprise of entrepreneurs across the economy, as they simultaneously discover that they have all committed investment errors. Rather than entrepreneurs serving their homeostatic function of correcting maladjustments, the entire market must adjust itself abruptly through an essentially simultaneous liquidation. What follows in the eyes of those who couldn't see the distortion is a dreaded tail event. If the market perceives, or rather prices, a large loss in the stock market is very unlikely, even when such perception and pricing are unwarranted. Obviously tremendous opportunity exists, even if only to protect a portfolio against such deleterious losses. The test depicted in figure 9.5 of the downloadable PDF was perhaps just a crude, though perfectly robust, they tend to go together, way of measuring the negative tail of monthly equity returns. There are endless other ways, ranging from the maximum likelihood hill estimator to log-log regressions of fractal dimensions, all of which show essentially the same thicker tails under higher MS index levels. In measuring the profits had by tail hedging, we, in fact, now have what I regard as the most economically intuitive and comprehensible method to measure the dreaded tail. In so doing, I will simultaneously thus illustrate the Austrian Investing One methodology. I present an analysis of a simplified, prototypical tail-hedged equity portfolio. In this discussion, I move from the commentator I was in previous chapters to practitioner. Tail-hedging, or Austrian Investing One, is at the center of what I practice in my investment partnerships, and Austrian Investing Two of Chapter 10, in combination with Austrian Investing One, is what I practice in my family office. However, while this is something of a glimpse into what I do in my funds, my actual approach is far more nuanced, as it is far beyond the scope and intention of this audiobook. It bears repeating, I am not telling anyone to run out and do this as described. Even the very generic version of tail hedging is very hard and involves options that are very illiquid, which makes pricing and taking profits very difficult. Nonetheless, this part of the discussion is meant to serve as a conservative and honest case study the purpose of which is, beyond further measuring tales, to demonstrate Austrian tools and the application of the roundabout approach through the conditional historical outperformance generated by adding extremely out-of-the-money puts to the S&P Composite Index. To begin with a little basic knowledge for listeners who are not familiar with options, a put is a derivative instrument that gives the holder the right but not the obligation to take a short position in the underlying security at the strike price e.g. an equity index such as the S&P Composite. With tail hedging, the puts involved are necessarily, by definition, extremely far out of the money, meaning the strike price at which they become exercisable is very far below the current market price. The portfolio I am testing in this study purchases two-month 0.5 delta puts on the S&P Composite Index, approximately 30% out of the money, in the case of a 40% implied volatility at the start of each strategy period at an assumed 40% starting volatility level, which is a historical median pricing level. And in fact, within a large range, the return outperformance levels reported are surprisingly robust to this pricing level. After every month, the two-month put options position is rolled. The existing options are sold and new two-month puts are purchased, which resets the position every month. A historical conservative interpolated mapping is utilized, which maps monthly index returns into concurrent monthly changes in pricing, or implied volatility, of the two-month puts for monthly Vega profit and loss, as well as changes in the pricing spread between one-month and two-month puts for monthly rolling. This mapping allows the test to include time periods before data are even available for options markets, thus providing a much greater range of market environments. Each month, the portfolio spends one-half of one percent on puts, and the remaining 99.5% stays invested in the S&P index. No leverage is employed, and in fact, typically when the market is down by not even 20%, 
the entire portfolio is actually net profitable. Each strategy period encompasses two years of returns, and outperformance measures are annualized and bucketed into quartiles according to the MS index level at the start of each respective period. The periods tested range from 1901, when the MS index data is first available, to the present. The outperformance mean and 95% confidence interval of the mean are calculated for each MS index quartile. All returns include reinvested dividends. The case study compares the returns when tail hedging is used versus only owning the S&P to determine if and when outperformance occurs and its magnitude. As figure 9.6 in the downloadable PDF shows, with more than 95% statistical confidence, just as we saw in figure 9.5, not surprisingly since both use essentially the same monthly return data, the benefits of tail hedging are highly conditional on levels of distortion as evidenced by the MS index. When the MS index is in the upper quartile, as it is as I write, there has been an approximate 4 percentage point outperformance of the Austrian Investing One strategy, or a tail hedged index portfolio over only owning the index, an outperformance that fades as the starting MS index level falls. Thus, there is a third choice between owning stocks or cash, as in the basic Misician strategy, in a high distortion environment. Indeed, when combined with the expected excess returns of equities alone shown in figure 9.2 of the downloadable PDF, it is clear that a tail-hedged equity portfolio is superior to any of the investment industry's misplaced fine-tuning between equities and cash only. This is the roundabout Austrian capitalizing on the fact that investing in far out of the money puts requires intertemporal vision, an indirect route, the likely loss and the immediate, as that one half of one percent spent on puts is lost each month without a crash, to achieving a later potential gain, the eventual profits from the puts, which are then invested in stocks whose subsequent returns will be much higher. Of course, those monthly put costs pale in comparison to the opportunity costs of being uninvested in stocks in the musician strategy. Each option represents a seed in time, a chance for the giant redwood to put down roots into future fire-scorched land. What to most is an immediate sunk cost, a capital investment in what seems unlikely at the peak of the boom to be a potential future crash in the making, is potential to the savvy Austrian investor in the context of his portfolio, both in the profit from his put options and the future compounding returns, new trees, to come from investing in resulting low MS index environment. Clearly, expecting a market purge need not be a doom and gloom approach. It is rather a tremendously opportunistic, optimistic approach for one with capital, means, in such an environment, specifically when malinvestment is being liquidated and the MS index becomes exceedingly low. Capital is not destroyed, rather, title just changes hands at more advantageous prices to the buyer. The obvious takeaway is the benefit to investors who have access to effective tail hedging. However, seeing only that conclusion misses the far larger and more important point to understand the source of this edge. As we know, both deductively and now inductively, from figure 9.6 of the downloadable PDF, the edge in the tail hedging strategy is driven by monetary distortion. I would argue that systemic tail hedging wouldn't be nearly as important, and probably not necessary at all, if it weren't for the distortion. The fact is, the many people who make predictions about the goodness of tail hedging as an asset class, something inconceivable as recently as when I launched Universa in 2007, without any thought to the environment of monetary distortion or the intertemporal effects on their investment decisions through time, are missing most of the story. When the MS index is high, tail hedging further becomes expected event hedging and provides the investing means for when the MS index is low. The Zeal and the Zvek Central Bank Hedging I have shown that the epistemological problems of black swans and tails can be quite advantageous, both in the musician strategy and, most notably, in Austrian Investing One. An extreme loss in the stock market is certainly priced into much of the equity derivatives markets as an extreme tail, i.e. extremely unlikely, despite such overwhelming evidence to the contrary. I cannot fully explain why this is, just as I cannot explain why the Austrian school remains, in Mises' words, the somewhat reluctantly tolerated outsider. But, given that the two are inherently one and the same, we should not be surprised. From the face of it, 
it is impossible to come to predicting or even understanding the properties of the most severe and rare events by extrapolating what we have already seen. There is a fundamental perception problem at the heart of this problem, a distributional illusion that can be shattered in an instant. Some may find this paradoxical coming from me, known as I am for tail hedging and so-called black swan investing. From my view, empirically and from a a priori Austrian interpretation, black swan events have been largely insignificant in at least the last century of capital investment in the United States, including the most recent crisis. Investors have, indeed, encountered surprising and pernicious events, but the fact is, those who were surprised have been those in the extreme majority, with either a blind or brazen disregard for the crucial concepts of Austrian capital theory and monetary credit expansions, and the corollary understanding of capital goods and the time structure of production. Of course, this does not mean that catastrophic free market capitalism destroying events, either man-made or not, couldn't have happened and the man-made variety has historically been entirely related to the interventionism discussed in this audiobook. We are dealing with the realm of entrepreneurial action within a competitive economic system and the monetary distortions that affect it. But note that during the 100-plus years of this study, there was much devastating unprecedented world conflict, including two world wars, which were still subsumed by Austrian praxeological principles when looking at equity market returns. It seems that tail hedging, as I have been explicitly practicing for about 15 years now, should be called central bank hedging, or better yet, as I have coined the term, Austrian Investing One. This activity over my career likely would have been much less interesting and fruitful without the insights of Mises and the cooperative actions of Federal Reserve Chairman Greenspan and Bernanke, to which I note with my hearty thanks, Danke schön, meine Herren. Wir sind jetzt alle Österreicher. Austrian Investing One is thus the autocataclytic process of indirect tools begetting greater tools, of profitable positions, which then beget even more profitable positions, a roundabout investment process. Puts are just as much about reinvesting cash at a market low as they are about making money on the path down to that low. Austrian Investing One and Two, which are encompassed here and in Chapter 10 respectively, both of which attain the ability to deploy capital where and when it is most productive, and then actually do it, are the destination toward which this audiobook has been aiming all along. Although the thought process is the important takeaway here, there are demands and perhaps even a requirement for investment books to provide action items. In the musician strategy discussed earlier, we switched between two choices, profiting from both a full equity position when the MS index was low and avoiding drawdowns with a full cash position when the MS index was high. This 100% Treasury bill position provided a roundabout position of advantage in a future period to be deployed as potential investments in titles to capital, i.e. equities, when the price of that capital is much lower, and thus its subsequent productivity and returns are much higher. The use of puts in Austrian Investing One is but a logical and even more effective progression from our simple cash position, a somewhat more refined, sure strategy. This is the ultimate game of Tui Show where yielding to the initial route is an intermediate step of Zohua toward the counter route of buying cheap title to productive capital and following, or Nian Swa, the market back to stationarity. As effective as the option trade is, it is but the prelude, an intermediate waypoint toward an even greater edge, an attack and counterattack. In the option trade is the temporal coordination of capital with its most advantageous and opportune use. The put options that comprise our tail hedge serve not only to provide even more liquid capital in a route for reinvestment, but also allow a large and even full investment in stocks during the distortion. Think of it as a fast-growing angiosperm with the serotonous cones of a conifer. It seems the stock versus cash decision of the basic musician strategy and of virtually all asset allocation decisions and a good bit of academic research is entirely misplaced with the availability of other such Austrian tools. The positioning of puts is the thingamajigger harpoon of Marco. The advanced tools, building blocks, or intermediate links, the Klauswitzian handeln, leading up to the effectual principle, but never as that principle itself. While generating profits from the hedge is its aim, its zeal, that is not the intended end. The profits are but the first stage of this roundabout investment scheme. The second is what is done with those profits within a world in which distortion has suddenly been burned away. 
Thus, the put positions are the middle for the zvek of highly productive capital investment, the superior technical productivity of means employed toward ends. The Roundabout Investor Admittedly, investing based on MS index levels to take advantage of distortion is not roundabout in the Bambaverkian sense of things. Eugen von Bambaverk did not discuss distortion, but it is roundabout in the Austrian sense because of its alignment with Umwig and its Taoist counterpart, Schur, in that our investment goal is to maximize our investment edge at some particularly advantageous intertemporal points in the future. Thus we are using time, or more specifically, roundaboutness, to attain higher capital productivity. Although our case study shows the importance of tail hedging, as we look at it on its own merit, we remind ourselves that we cannot confuse it with the Zweck, the end goal in itself. For me, the hedge is a zeal, an intermediate objective, a waypoint of advantage along a roundabout path known as Austrian investing. With this perspective, we can also see a link between Austrian investing one and the basic strategy presented earlier in this chapter of avoiding the market when the MS index is high and exploiting the market when it is low. The commonality of the two strategies, one to pinpoint when to avoid the market and the other to exploit the distortion, is the importance of preserving and generating capital to be deployed opportunistically later, when the moment is right. Thus, tail hedging is, indeed, sure, becoming the means and setup for strategic positional advantage, a fully loaded crossbow with extra arrows in the quiver, to be fired later when the vulnerable target appears. As such, tail hedging is a tool that allows us to actually exploit the distortion and not succumb to it. Now, in the next chapter, we hear what real investment and capitalistic production is all about as we gain a full appreciation of what is so special about this process. And so from Austrian investing one, insulating ourselves from the trap of distortion and even profiting from it, we move on to Austrian investing two, which is grounded in the wisdom of Bambaverk's roundabout and straightforward lesson, thanks to the Austrians, of how to invest in such a manner. We take a page out of the Austrian classics as we accumulate the means of production and heed the entrepreneurial charge. Thus, as investors, we become fully Austrian in thought and action. Chapter 10 Austrian Investing 2 Siegfried, Exploiting the Bambaverkian Roundabout The roundabout route, leading first to an intermediate point, a zeal, from which to launch the next campaign in pursuit of the destination, the Zweck, is the roadmap for Austrian investing. On the first leg of this journey, as I laid out in Chapter 9, with Austrian Investing 1, we focused on the distortion in the financial markets, indicated by the telltale sign of an MS index significantly higher than 1. Recall that this signal tells us that the physical structure of production of the real economy has been, through monetary sleight of hand, coerced away from stationarity, and is poised to snap back again as the forces of negative feedback become even stronger. Once we have identified such a scenario, we can exploit our knowledge, elusive to most, and known only through study of Austrian theory, through two basic responses. We either can keep our capital on the sidelines in reserve, what I have called the basic Mesician strategy, or we can enter positions that opportunistically generate capital when its deployment is most effective, the more sophisticated complement of tail hedging, and what I call Austrian investing one. Sure, strategies all. Now, in this chapter, we are ready for the second part, where we seek out opportunities that are aligned with the true Bambaverkian roundabout of the Austrian Unternehmer. Rather than gauging the stationarity, or lack thereof, of the market as a whole, in Austrian Investing II, I zoom in on the individual firms and their exceedingly heterogeneous capital, moving from the macro to the micro, which is only fitting for an investment philosophy bearing the name Austrian. In so doing, we deploy all the tools we have amassed thus far to scout out and capture those rare roundabout investments that will make us truly Austrian investors. As always, we are guided by the Austrians' principles of parsimony and fidelity to reality. That is, they say only what they can say in simple tautological language, as opposed to the convoluted mathematical models of the mainstream, with the fewest inputs, if you will, which leaves them extremely constrained. By restricting themselves to qualitative but necessarily true statements, the Austrians often come under fire, even today, as being quaint or medieval. 
Yet they avoid the false precision that plagues the smartest guys in the room, who built impressive and clever computer models of the financial markets that seemed to predict just fine, until they didn't. Needless to say, this hyper-precise modeling approach, which characterized long-term capital management and other strategies cooked up by the mathematical experts, is diametrically opposed to our uniquely Austrian methodology. Just as I stated in Chapter 9, only the thinking behind Austrian investing can validate it. An investment strategy that seemed to work on the historical data can famously disappear, assuming it was not a spurious mirage in the first place, as soon as analysts become aware of it. This is one of the central findings in the efficient markets literature. But in this audiobook, I have used deductive Austrian reasoning to explain systematic forces of disequilibrium, and our logic also explains why other presumably non-Austrian investors, having a distinct humanness about them, will leave the proverbial money on the table. Our look at the data indicates not the truth of the underlying theory, but rather it shows us the magnitude of the potential gains. The historical data show us the importance of our theoretical deductions. Roundabout investing, a very apt synonym for Austrian investing, is all about the temporal structure of productive capital. As we recall from the slow-growing at first conifers and Henry Ford's capital structure extending from raw materials to automobiles, production by its very nature takes time. Roundabout production, therefore, cannot focus myopically on the immediate profit. Rather, it invests teleologically, building the indirect means, the positional advantage, toward the ends of profits that will not materialize in the near term. In fact, as we will see, it is all the better for us that such evidence is hidden from the rest of the investing public who focus on the scene and impatiently gobble today's marshmallows. Their impatience makes them blind to future potential, tomorrow's profits that are yet unseen but can, if we know where and how to look, be foreseen. Indeed, Austrian investing too, like Austrian investing one, is all about the straightforward plan of attack comprised in this audiobook, being patient now in order to be strategically impatient later. Siegfried, the Dragon Slayer The telltale sign of what we are seeking is highly productive capital. From a Bambaverkian perspective, we know that the most productive capital is also the most roundabout capital. In a physical sense, the result is obvious. Bambaverk taught us that we can always find technological ways of producing more output with our inputs, if only we are willing to wait longer. Yet I want to go further and claim what is not so obvious, perhaps even to Austrian listeners. The most profitable capital structures will tend to be very roundabout as well. I am focusing here on the Austrian model of capital and production, that we have understood in teleomechanisms from the conifer to the caterpillar and the strategy of Robinson Crusoe acquiring later stage advantages of efficiency through present stage disadvantages, roundaboutness. In this audiobook, I have developed a code word for highly productive roundabout capital, a name that embodies the best of the Bambaverkian approach, Siegfried. As we recall from our parable of Nibelungenland in Chapter 7, there is something special about Siegfried, joyous in victory, slayer of dragons, entrepreneurial hero, which allows him to provide the best products to consumers with great efficiency as his trees and pastures and goat herd flourish thanks to his exquisite wunderhorn playing. Like Henry Ford, with time Siegfried amasses a roundabout capital structure to make products that people want to buy when they want to buy them. Therefore, we know that the mark of a true Siegfried is a high return on investment capital, ROIC, best calculated by dividing a company's EBIT operating earnings before interest and tax expenses are deducted, by its invested capital, the operating capital required to generate that EBIT. Wisely, Siegfried continually reinvests his profits into his business, becoming increasingly more roundabout, instead of pocketing the profits by paying out high dividends to himself or just accumulating cash. He is driven to act by what he sees as false prices on his factors of production, his capital and other costs are just too low relative to the prices at which he can subsequently sell his finished products. To put it simply, his enterprise can transform dollars spent on inputs into dollars earned from customers at a much higher rate than he could earn by lending the money out. A true entrepreneur, Siegfried finds those false prices to be, in Mises's words, intolerable. When he sees them, he has to act. 
which ineluctably makes him become increasingly roundabout, as he is continually building new roundabout capital from square one, and therefore even more efficient in the future. While driven by his ends, profitability, he takes aim on his means, the tools of higher-order capital goods. Most important of all, what truly makes Siegfried a Siegfried is that he is not all that sensitive to interest rates. His profitability is not terribly contingent upon marginal movements in everyone's time preferences or the central bank's imposition of artificial interest rates. Of course, Siegfried is not perfect. When there is a big credit collapse and a liquidation of assets following a period of monetary distortion, Siegfried will see a decline in his ROIC. Even he lost a little in 2008. But his capital likely remains profitable and productive, well above his cost of capital, even if the central bank should suddenly and sharply raise interest rates in the thick of a boom. After such a surprise move by the central bank to take away the punch bowl, the Gunthers of the world will be crushed, as their bloated enterprises were utterly dependent on the artificially cheap credit of the boom. They will be forced to scale back operations or fold altogether. In contrast, Siegfried will be okay, as his business model remains fundamentally sound. In the mass liquidation of the Gunthers, the crashing prices of various business inputs may cause Siegfried to regret some of his purchases made at the height of the boom, but that will be a luxurious position compared to many of his peers. Siegfried is akin to the conifer, as he willingly turns his back on the fray of fast growth that often exists only because of the artificial fertilizer of distortion, and thus is overlooked by those who have no way to appreciate what he is constructing. They are mesmerized by the fast but likely unsustainable growth of the angiosperm hairs. With an intertemporal perspective, Siegfried seeds what looks like the prime places stampeded with competitors who race for the win, and instead he happily retreats, Wunderhorn in hand, to the rocky places, where the growing is hard at first, as he forgoes his profits today to build his tools of later efficiencies. Yet to perseverance and tenacity and an intertemporal view come the payoffs, rewarding those who are not obsessed with today and instead have a depth of field perspective. Yes, Siegfried will grow more slowly now, so slowly that he may not appear to be growing his profits at all, as he amasses his roundabout capital structure. But when the time is ripe, he will emerge with the greatest advantages, and when the field of competition is cleared by the wildfire that destroys unhealthy, malinvested growth, he is still standing, even ready to advantageously invest more. His slow but deliberate roundabout growth has given him the structure he needs to accelerate later on, to kick into high gear and outperform the rest, the tortoise that morphs into a hare, and then surpasses the mere hare. To move from our fable to an operational strategy for the real non-Wagnerian world, note that Siegfried qualifies as our investment ideal because of the first of two criterion, high ROIC, which prompts him to keep reinvesting profits into his capital structure to become even more efficient and eventually grow. This pattern explains why we should expect a strong correlation between above-average returns and a roundabout capital structure, even though such a connection is not usually made even among Austrian writers, and this expectation is confirmed by data. High ROIC firms show consistently and significantly greater increases in their invested capital compared to non-high ROIC firms. Academic Austrians tend to view above-average returns, what they would call pure profit as opposed to mere interest earnings, as due to superior entrepreneurial vision, while capital roundaboutness is handled in a separate equilibrium analysis of interest rates. Yet I claim that in the actual market, we should expect these two Austrian concepts to overlap substantially. Consider, the entrepreneur who foresees a profit opportunity in the distant future and who patiently reinvests earnings into his business year after year in anticipation has a much greater opportunity for, eventually, posting an enormous ROIC than entrepreneurs who are engaged in short-term projects. The fewer the rings spanned on Bombawerk's Jahresringe, the more commoditized the business. Thus, while there may be no direct cause and effect relationship between capital roundaboutness and above average returns, once we think through the actual forces governing them, we come to expect an observed ex post correlation between the two. As Austrian investors, by which I mean capitalistic investors seeking to accumulate productive capital, as opposed to the more common mere gambler investors seeking to exploit changes in prices on title to capital, 
we have two basic choices of roundabout paths. One path is to go the Siegfried route ourselves, as that other ideal Austrian entrepreneur Henry Ford did when he doggedly amassed factors of production to build his own self-contained, ever deeper and more productive capital structure. We too could mimic Siegfried and bring together our own factors of production in such a way that allows us to be similarly roundabout in our production as we discover and exploit what to us are false prices. The high ROIC of our Siegfried means that relative to his competitors, he is very good at taking investment dollars and transforming them into earnings. The ratio is much better than the going price of capital. This, of course, requires something special, a great insight, and an unwavering belief in what is perhaps merely a promising hunch, the Verstehen of Chapter 7. One might think of this as the burden of the angel investor. While important and sometimes even lucrative, this is beyond the scope of this audiobook. Yet as Austrian investors, there is another option open to us, to identify a metaphorical Siegfried and own a piece of him. That is, we can use our funds to buy title to some of his existing operation. We can thus exploit what are false prices only to Siegfried, by acquiring and then stepping into his shoes. Yet this route has an additional variable, which makes us take pause. Unfortunately, we should presume that it will cost us dearly to get in. The baseline assumption of efficient capital markets would be that other investors are just as keen as we are, and that the price of stock in a Siegfried would already reflect the tremendous economic advantage indicated by his high ROIC, which is, of course, public knowledge. Yet for whatever reasons, and I will give my own thoughts and evidence shortly, this is not always the case. In other words, in the real financial markets, we often encounter high ROIC Siegfried firms where these superior efficiencies at turning invested and reinvested capital into future earnings are apparently not priced in. Back in Chapter 5, in our discussion of forestry development, I explained a concept that we can now fully deploy. In addition to casting our net for firms with a high ROIC, we are also looking for firms with a low Faustmann ratio meaning a low market capitalization of common equity over net worth or invested capital plus cash minus debt and preferred equity ratio. In Chapter 5, I explained that this Faustmann ratio is driven by the degree to which the ROIC exceeds the cost of that capital. So clearly one might expect high Faustmann ratios where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts or the sum of the factors of production to accompany high ROICs. When we make this more realistic and allow for the reinvestment of profits into more land, and thus eventual growth in those profits, this robust relationship remains. Stating it in Nibelungen terms, we want to acquire ever more roundabout Siegfrieds while they are priced like break-even Johans or even struggling Gunthers. The ultimate end for the Austrian investor is the same as for any other investor, profit. Yet the means are entirely different. Here, they are the central focus. The Austrian investor doesn't lunge in Lee fashion immediately for the goal. He doesn't set out directly to find firms with immediately rising profitability, or firms to hold while others also pile in immediately, or firms with immediate dividend yields, or even underpriced firms per se. Rather, his first task is to find highly roundabout, productive firms, ones with high ROIC that possess the circuitous means of economic profit, then to these Siegfrieds, he applies a second filter or screen and looks for firms with a low Faustmann ratio. This two-pronged approach would strike most investors as quixotic, simplistic, and even contradictory. By this point in the audiobook, though, the listener should understand that such a commonplace attitude is precisely what will deliver remarkable rewards to the roundabout Austrian investor. This strategy is neither easy nor automatic. We certainly won't find these companies on a Siegfried stock watch list, and they likely won't be making headlines. Some tricky analyses of financial statements are necessary, and we will have to resist once again that very humanness about us. Strangely, Siegfrieds are often the quiet, hidden, and even scorned treasures in the world of investment, because they often appear to be doing nothing much of anything at all, not progressing, even regressing, except for one very important thing. We can be confident that the incentives are there for them to diligently and roundaboutly reinvest capital. Thus, our goal is to identify precisely those firms that, in light of Austrian economics, we expect to eventually progress or grow their EBIT and thus deliver, perhaps after a large lag, 
a substantial return on investment in ownership of the firms. To drive home the rationale behind this Austrian approach, it might help if I note that neither of these screens in isolation is enough to warrant our attention. For example, a firm with a high ROIC but a correspondingly high Faustmann ratio will be expected to experience its roundabout earnings growth, that is true. It might make sense as investors to take our funds and buy the same factors of production, at the same false prices, in order to copycat such a firm. But its high Faustmann ratio means we don't want to invest in that firm by buying shares of its stock. On the other hand, suppose we encounter a firm with a relatively low Faustmann ratio that also has a low ROIC. Armed with Austrian insights, we pass on such a firm. Yes, the low Faustmann ratio might lead us to believe that the financial markets are, for some reason, underpricing the productivity embedded in the physical capital assets of the firm. Yet the firm's low ROIC makes us pause. If management perceives that the operation cannot earn a higher return on reinvested earnings than the going rate of interest, we can hardly expect them to plow the profits back into the business, and even if they did, it would be economically destructive malinvestment. Without more information, we should worry that this firm will provide no entrepreneurial profit, will thus not progress, and worse yet, will even regress. Now that I've spelled out why either criterion in isolation is inadequate, we can more fully appreciate why the two operating in tandem is just what the Austrian doctor ordered. A firm with a high ROIC will naturally engage in high rates of reinvestment in the business. The managers almost cannot help themselves, as this is a simple matter of putting available funds to work in an outlet with a proven track record and over which they have exquisite control. Armed with our knowledge of Bambaverkian capital theory, we have a general presumption that such a firm eventually will be reappraised by the market as more efficient than its peers, as the accumulated roundaboutness eventually manifests in greater economic profit. How then does the second criterion, a simultaneously low Faustmann ratio, come into play? Here we draw on Bambaverkian subjective value theory. The simple fact is that many investors, including and even especially professional asset managers, suffer from extremely concentrated time preference, or what the literature calls hyperbolic discounting, discussed extensively in Chapter 6. Now, we have an explanation for why the asset markets may be undervaluing, dinging our productive little Siegfried, despite its bright future. The various equity analysts and investment managers may have concluded that this particular Siegfried will not see its earnings grow any time soon enough. If the listener wants a real-world explanation for why this tends to be, even among highly productive firms, consider the fact that a sustained program of high capital expenditures would make a firm more roundabout, but would also depress future earnings for some time, as the income statements are saddled with higher depreciation expenses. Of course, in any specific case, the actual reason for an apparent undervaluation could be something quite legitimate, such as a pending lawsuit or regulatory ruling. Yet if we aim to find simple, axiomatic, Austrian rules of thumb for identifying stocks likely to return superior returns, our two criteria, rooted in the Bambaverkian treatment of capital theory and subjective value theory, are remarkably robust. The high ROIC flags for us firms that are likely to experience earnings growth, while the relatively low Faustmann ratio further segregates those firms where other investors apparently underappreciate this lucrative prize, lying as it does just beyond the horizon and at the end of a roundabout route. It might be, of course, that for any particular firm, the insiders know something we don't. But in the aggregate, it might also be simply that most investors have a more immediate horizon, a much shallower depth of field than we do. Austrian Investing II is indeed the sibling to Austrian Investing I. These Austrian kinder are both essentially angling to accomplish the same roundabout task, to continually and cumulatively own highly productive capital. One might say that Austrian Investing I went about this longitudinally, by exploiting opportunities available intertemporally across time, and one might say that Austrian Investing II is now going about this cross-sectionally, by exploiting opportunities available at the same point in time. A handful of Siegfrieds found each month, for instance. Our pedagogical conifers, in their retreat to the rocky places, in order to ultimately outgrow their neighbors and intermittently take their land, 
similarly employ both cross-sectional and longitudinal strategies, respectively. This, too, is a highly intertemporal strategy, as was the case in Austrian Investing 1. Here, in Austrian Investing 2, we find that as we wait, in this case for EBIT to grow and the stock price to subsequently rise, we actively construct the very means of our subsequent superior profits. Production Sumweg requires an intertemporal exchange of payment now for the tools of higher productivity later. To be soft now in order to be hard later. To retreat in this moment in order to advance all the more imperiously later on. And we know that the Bambaverkian opportunities of Austrian Investing II, like the Mizician opportunities of Austrian Investing I, are hidden from the eyes of less discerning investors. They see in these Siegfrieds only Johanns or Gunthers, or, to switch our metaphor for a moment, the vast majority of investors encounter a hungry Robinson Crusoe, whom they see as catching fewer fish, which seems to make his operation unattractive, and they want no part of it. However, the savvy minority of investors, appreciating Austrian insights, can see beneath the surface and recognize when Crusoe is hungry, not because of sloth or ineptitude, but because he is currently investing his resources into building a boat and a net. The Austrian investor sees the fish jumping offshore and realizes that Crusoe's inability to catch them is merely a temporary condition, as Crusoe is preparing himself for the big catch further downstream. Case Study Buying the Siegfrieds We are now ready to observe our scorned Siegfrieds in action in the real world. Our laboratory is the CompuStat database of reported financial data, as well as historical stock price and dividend data, going back to the 1970s. Let's start by looking at the Siegfrieds and confirming that they do, in fact, tend to remain Siegfrieds. After all, if Siegfrieds were to quickly deteriorate into Johans, then certainly our presumption of their ever-advantageous roundaboutness would be mistaken. On theoretical grounds, we expect a firm with high ROIC to remain in such standing, as its managers will continue to reinvest in the firm. Why wouldn't they? and this will only further solidify their positions of competitive advantage. The data match up with our theoretical deduction. It turns out that high ROICs have been sustainable. In figure 10.1 of the downloadable PDF, we see that the Siegfrieds, the top line, defined here as firms realizing 75% or higher ROIC at the start of each 10-year period, have tended to persist as Siegfrieds, or have retained their elevated ROIC by the end of each 10-year period. To be clear, I acknowledge that there is nothing guaranteeing this result, and no doubt we can find individual firms with high ROICs one year that lapse into low ROICs in the future, or even go bankrupt. This is even assured by the preeminent regression fallacy, whereby an extreme value generated by random noise in a data series is consequently reversed when the noise abates and assigning meaning to that reversal is a mistake. Mistaking the deliberately roundabout swerves described in this audiobook for randomness is a similar, though inverse, error. Yet in the real world, the type of far-sighted entrepreneurs who constantly reinvest earnings are the very people poised to seize profit opportunities that have eluded others, and they are ahead in the capital configuration race, so that in the aggregate, we expect a persistence in high ROIC. The statistical result is even more reasonable once we consider that certain intangible assets, such as the rewards of research and development, or brand name recognition, or the leadership skills of an owner, will very often show up in the measured return on tangible capital. We can see that being a Siegfried comes with tremendous advantage. In order to reap that advantage, and more specifically the advantages of Bombaverk's insights, my aim here is to turn these insights into portfolios, as it were. Now I will construct portfolios of Siegfrieds, choosing the best handful every month, using a highly robust screen, meaning wild numbers don't have an undue effect, as I equal weight each purchase. Each month I purchase the lowest Faustmann ratio firms among those with recent ROICs above 100%, with further screening for size and liquidity, and I turn them over as they eventually fail to meet our criteria, checking each year. I ignore fishy financial values as well as sectors like banks. I start the test in 1978, solely due to requirements for sufficient available data. I use a spliced combination of CompuStat's point-in-time database, available starting in 1987, and its non-point-in-time database, as is apparent, 
These results don't materially change if I restrict myself just to the more timely point-in-time data. Figure 10.2 in the downloadable PDF shows this simple portfolio's results, specifically the cumulative equity in the strategy, starting at $1 in 1978, through time compared to the S&P Composite Index. Needless to say, these are tremendous results, like Austrian Investing 1 beating most, if not in this case all peers, in the simplest of non-optimized screens, another basic toy strategy, built only on economic logic and focusing on just ROIC and the Faustmann ratio. However, again, these data say nothing of the validity of the Bombaverg arguments on roundaboutness. The data show us only the displayed magnitude of importance. Now, let's investigate what's going on under the hood here. Put simply, why are there highly productive firms, ROIC over 100% is an outrageously big number, so scorned that they have such low Faustmann ratios to meet our thresholds? It turns out, as figure 10.3 in the downloadable PDF shows, and as we anticipated, among the Siegfrieds, operationally defined in figure 10.3, as companies with ROICs above 50%, in order to provide enough data for comparative significance, those with the lowest first quartile Faustmann ratios, the dark line at the bottom, have seen their subsequent EBITs take a temporary turn for the worse, and the shaded 95% confidence region around the mean EBIT changes for the lowest Faustmann ratio bucket indicates the rigor in this statement. In fact, the statistically significant differences between each progressive Faustmann bucket would suggest that the market is actually pricing these differences in, as the EBIT paths diverge at one year, and as guidance and analyst forecasts seem to predict this far out in the future fairly well, this should not be surprising at all. What should be surprising, at first, is how fooled the market tends to be over the subsequent one to two year bend in the road. When you consider that these divergences are essentially, even entirely, with high statistical significance, accounted for by spurts of fixed and intangible capital spending, this is all the more surprising. These first quartile Siegfrieds are merely becoming more roundabout, sacrificing today for growth tomorrow and paying the price today. As we know, roundabout production, bearing the costs of capital investment, typically results in an immediate hit on profits, particularly from non-capitalized investment such as research and development. Our constant refrain sounds again. We live in the scene, what is available to us, and we extrapolate the scene such that we are deceived as it curves. Minor leaguers hit linearly extrapolated fastballs. Major leaguers hit curveballs. The roundabout is hard, and we are not biologically cut out for it. Thus, the stock market tends to be about immediate bets or expectations on distant outcomes. Yet all that matters to the bettors tends to be the immediate outcomes. That is, among high ROIC firms, stock valuations and the resulting Faustmann ratios seem to anticipate future profits in the short run so accurately that they miss the curves and the change-ups. It is a doctrine of investing that stocks follow their earnings, that, in the words of Peter Lynch, it's the earnings that waggle the wiggles in the stock market. So what's the sense of wasting time on sluggards? And naturally, the near-term earnings are all we see. As it turns out, stock market investors are less savvy than the hoary forestry investors of ages past, who overcame the dreaded axiom of the axe and saw the faster and more profitable tree growth just around the corner. The market focuses on immediate profits and growth thereof, immediate progress, all the while treating the productivity of the means of those profits as homogenous. This is the penalty assessed by the myopic market as the price of production Zumweg. The premium goes to the marshmallow produced today, while punishment is meted out on Siegfrieds that devote their profits to becoming more efficient in marshmallow production tomorrow. No wonder Henry Ford tried to avert equity partners and considered typical Wall Street investment to be a sideshow. Contrary to my central tenet from Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson from Chapter One, the markets truly look at just the immediate rather than at the longer effects of capital and production processes. These are the two games always at play, with so little competition in the latter. Figure 10.3 in the downloadable PDF is reminiscent of Figure 2.1, depicting growth rates of conifers and angiosperms in Chapter 2. It is the quintessential Bambaverkian roundabout. Turn figure 10.3 90 degrees counterclockwise, and we see my favorite image of literally going right in order to go left, 
That is, the first quartile Faustman ratio firms see lower EBIT for about the first two years, in contrast to the immediate growth of firms with higher Faustman ratios. And when one considers what's driving this detour to the right, it becomes clear that this is indeed going right in order to then better go left. Of course, all the other quartile firms have already engaged in the roundabout and are thus already headed left, and of course the market fully appreciates them by then. In the tyranny of first consequences, in the market's systematic scorn for this circuitous path through the indirect means of economic growth, lies the very edge of Austrian investing too. The best investment approach may even be to search out such high ROIC companies where forward profits are expected to take this detour, a very difficult thing to do. The good news is we don't have to, as the market seems to be already systematically doing it for us. The next question to ask is, just how insulated are our Siegfrieds from the booms and busts of distortion demonstrated in the previous chapter? Since a Siegfried, by definition, is a far-sighted visionary, who can better anticipate future market conditions than his peers, and who has spent years building up a roundabout capital structure accordingly, and whose ROIC far exceeds his cost of capital, and his investment plans are thus generally insensitive to movements in rates, we should expect that he is more protected than the Johans, and certainly the Gunthers, from engaging in malinvestment. Let's see what actually happened in the data. Siegfrieds aren't perfect. They are still exposed to the cluster of errors of distortion, just not as much as everyone else in the market. When the average stock does really well or poorly, as denoted in figure 10.4 of the downloadable PDF by the S&P composite gaining or losing more than 20% in a year, respectively. So too relatively, with over 95% confidence, does the Siegfried strategy, as seen in the conditional mean annual returns, the light bar, and 20th percentile drawdowns, the lowest dark bar, in figure 10.4 of the downloadable PDF. Thus, the Siegfried strategy benefits from low MS index regimes, when the S&P composite has high subsequent returns, as per the previous chapter, and is somewhat hurt by high MS index regimes, when the S&P composite similarly has low subsequent returns. Overlaying the same intertemporal strategy of the previous chapter, of facilitating opportunistic capital deployment following the routes of distortion, on the present strategy will confer even greater advantages. It truly pays to take a roundabout route toward roundabout capitalistic production, that is, our Austrian kinder, Austrian investing one and two, get along well together, the former well hedges the latter, and the latter is the superior deployment of capital to which the former serves. In Austrian investing is a cohesive whole of intertemporal opportunism, and the roundabout acquisition and construction of the factors of production, indeed, from the strategic framework and logic accumulated through the entirety of this audiobook, comes an effective framework for investors of all stripes and means. Value Investing Austrian Investing's Estranged Air Austrian Investing 1 and 2 should both sound somewhat reminiscent of what has come to be known as value investing. Indeed, Austrian investing can be seen as value investing's intellectual forerunner, not only drawing on insights older than value investing but, more significantly, providing clarity and focus to its underpinnings and ultimate systematic source of return. Although their paths cross at times, value investing does not strictly follow the Tao of capital. There are significant differences, largely in the thinking behind the strategies, most specifically Austrian investing's deliberately roundabout approach rooted in a firm understanding of its edge. No mystery, as claimed by value investing's founder, in its pursuit of Siegfried opportunism, Thus, we can say that Benjamin Graham, considered the father of value investing and security analysis itself, and the horde of value investors who have followed his treatises are, in effect, an estranged brood of Austrians, an unwittingly splintered faction. Understanding the differences should help us refine, focus, and improve the broader approach of value investing, and perhaps coax some to the orthodoxy of the Austrians. Such adjustments to what is already an ingrained approach as well as a better understanding of the real source of information and edge in the approach, as we will see, can be most productive. Benjamin Graham was born Benjamin Grossbaum. The family name means large tree in German. So apropos, since he came so close to the archetypal conifer strategy in London in 1894. The surname was changed on account of the German prejudice surrounding the Great War. 
The family moved to New York when Graham was a year old and enjoyed a comfortable lifestyle until his father died in 1903 and his porcelain business began to fail. His mother turned the family home into a boarding house and then borrowed money to trade stocks on margin, which left the family in poverty after the crash of 1907. After attending Columbia University on scholarship, Graham became a clerk in a bond trading firm, then an analyst, a partner, and finally principal of his own firm. A Keynesian interventionist, particularly regarding the inadequacy of consumption during economic downturns, Graham extolled a commodity-based currency that was very similar to the so-called Ford Edison money of Chapter 5, and, like Keynes, he was blindsided by the great market crash that came at the end of the Roaring Twenties. Ludwig von Mises, as we recall from Chapter 7, had little company in predicting the Great Depression. Graham, the Dean of Wall Street, lost nearly 70% of his largely arbitrage portfolio in 1929 through 1932. This would become a most formative experience for him, likely responsible for much of his value investing principles that would evolve. This was a purely inductive lesson, establishing value investing's legacy of remembering the Depression, though without ever recognizing the distortion that caused it. Graham's opening line of security analysis, from Horace, though it could be right out of the Lao Tzu, Many shall be restored that now are fallen, and many shall fall that now are in honor, tells the paradoxical story of the monetary-fueled market swings we saw in Chapter 9, and in that is a pretty good, though overly simplistic, approximation of Austrian investing one. There is perhaps no better illustration of his central margin of safety principle in action than Figure 9.3 in the downloadable PDF. In Graham's metaphor of the bipolar Mr. Market is a sound, though proximate, approach to avoiding the ultimately Austrian explained traps of distortion and entrepreneurial incompleteness of the imaginations. Had he heeded the Austrians, he no doubt would have diagnosed the real causes of Mr. Market's personality disorder. There is much common ground between value investing and its Austrian predecessor. Certainly value investing is as close as we come to it in practice today having become a popular intuitive approach, though I would argue that a small percentage of the value practitioners truly share the original focus laid out by Graham in his authoritative texts, Security Analysis in 1934 and The Intelligent Investor in 1949, the same publication year as Mises' English-language version of Human Action. One might say that Graham gave the practice of investing a rigor, logic, and entrepreneurial orientation not commonly seen before. And in that, he was very Austrian, as Graham famously noted, investment is most intelligent when it is most businesslike. Perhaps Graham's greatest insight was to stay out of the shadows of securities markets, ignore the sideshows, and instead focus entirely on the entrepreneurial action itself, the business, the capital. A diligent researcher of stocks, he had a laser focus on capital as the tangible asset and the thing that is ultimately owned in a stock. We can see this in the MS index and the Faustman ratio, as well as Graham's price to book ratio, or P over B, which simply compares a firm's equity to its total net depreciated book assets. All three ask, what is the whole relative to the sum of its parts? It is not clear whether Graham ever read Faustman or the Austrians directly. Though he was fluent in German, he admitted to being unschooled in economics. In his P over B approach alone, Graham had good results. After adding a litany of quantitative screens, from debt restrictions to long-term earnings and dividend growth, and stability to price-to-earnings, P over E ratios, spelled out in his book, The Intelligent Investor, over his long career as an investor he did quite well. His multi-ingredient quantitative stock portfolio recipe is the stuff of modern-day financial engineers. We might say, however, that traditional value investing has been something of a misnomer, Traditional value stocks, defined by low P over B and P over E ratios, have been shown to have statistically similar revenue growth as traditional growth stocks, and have had lower ROIC than growth stocks. This is yet another instance of naively treating all capital as the same, as a homogenous blob. Consider that P over B and P over E ratios are utterly incommensurable unless we assume all firms have the same basic capital structure. In reality, Firms have different degrees of roundaboutness, and hence variability in their ROIC. Indeed, investors must always delve deeper into the means of economic profit, certainly a central message of this audiobook.
Between Austrian investing and value investing is again the difference between depth of field and the telescopic long term. The latter is about waiting patiently over a long interval, as if for a far-off coupon at the very end, the plodding tortoise, or Marco, sitting with his rod. The former is about patience now in gathering the factors of greater potential coupons to come, the accelerating tortoise, hare, or crusoe. Both require discipline and patience, but Austrian investing is concerned with the intertemporal process at work, rather than just the endpoint. Interestingly, the man who is most closely associated with value investing today, Graham's one-time pupil and perhaps one of the most successful investors in history, Warren Buffett himself, once had a close brush with the Austrian school via his father, Howard Buffett. In a letter from 1962, Howard wrote to Austrian economist Murray Rothbard, seeking a copy of his book, The Panic of 1819, for his son Warren, who is a particularly avid reader of books about panics and similar phenomenon. It is apparent that, despite the son's later vocal criticisms of much of what could be considered Austrian orthodoxy, his basic investing actions are more closely aligned with it than he would ever admit. Most have forgotten how unpopular, and even ridiculed, Warren's yielding, Zohua, and very Mazician cash position was in the late 1990s. Over the years, value has sprouted many variations on the Austrian Grammian theme. In 1992, Eugene Fama and Kenneth French formalized a value factor, which was basically Graham's P over B measure. Another approach, called the Magic Formula by Joel Greenblatt, combines our traditional ROIC screen with a simple EBIT relative to enterprise value screen. And there is a similar screen known as Quality, whereby high gross profits to assets, which avoids penalizing high capital investment, and low P over B ratios are selected. These cover the variation gamut, though there are certain countless sub-variations on these, including their intersection, such as perhaps the approach of Buffett, and in fact triangulate or cross-verify the Austrian Investing II approach. All introduce noise by assuming additional degrees of freedom, too many to name, in this case of Graham's intricate screens, heterogeneous capital productivity, in this case of Fama French's sole P over B parameter, heterogeneous EBIT growth rates, in the case of Greenblatt's growth-sensitive P over E parameters, and heterogeneous capital depreciation and thus productivity, in the case of Quality's depreciation-free gross profit parameter. But as much as they might approximate this approach, they fail to necessarily isolate what matters, roundabout capital and its price. So we should expect these variations to capture some of the Siegfried portfolios, some of their edge, but with some added noise, evident in lower returns resulting from lower information content in the screening methods used, as well as inconsistencies across a range of portfolio construction methods employed. To see if this expectation holds, I tested the performance of these portfolios. In my experiment, I own 40 stock positions for one year, and I stagger how many I buy in each monthly mini-portfolio in different ways, as well as limiting how large each mini-portfolio as well as each position may swell before constraining it. Such variation and somewhat arbitrary portfolio construction techniques result in essentially different portfolio constituents, and thus nicely reveal a degree of luck and inconsistency in some of these results, as well as remove much of any ability to optimize, thus keeping the author honest. All portfolios share the same screens, ranging from tradability, size constraints, and general noise constraints. I start the tests in 1978, as before, which once again doesn't impact the relative results. Figure 10.5 of the downloadable PDF shows the range of performances found, as well as the mean performance across this range. Here we see a literal stair step up from the naive capitalization weighted SP composite up to our most pure and archetypal Austrian approach, the Siegfried's portfolio. It is not an evolution, as the top step came first in the historical development of these approaches, and the others sporadically branched from each other, but it is nonetheless a refinement of both the methodology and, most importantly, of the thinking behind them. The point is, that we have a methodology that separates the wheat from the chaff, focusing on what matters and ignoring what doesn't. In this, and to its credit, the value approach has come very close. But focusing the mind does so much more than just adding an additional 5 to 10 percentage points to what some smart investors are already doing pretty well. Most importantly, it provides a logical and sound basis for understanding the why. 
The rigor and appeal of Austrian investing is in the intuitive logic of its principles. Even before we test, we know why our edge exists. For most value investors, even when they see the edge that their approach provides, they do not comprehend it, typically relying on mere nebulous long-term price mean reversions. And Graham famously called it one of the mysteries of our business, and it is a mystery to me as well as everybody else. They thus remain susceptible to being swept away by the next seemingly attractive investment scheme and distorted environment to come along, as even Graham himself was in the late 1920s. Truly, the why is all that matters when we are faced with our profound intertemporal constraints amid investment results that appear, to the Phineas gauges among us, unacceptably inconsistent, even recklessly irresponsible. Understanding that we are investing in a means to subsequently greater profitability, not greater profits themselves, we see that we must take the detour in order to gain the intertemporal edge of greater tools. Such thinking clears our field of view, giving it that all-important depth. When considered as a somewhat noisy and tweaked version of Austrian investing, perhaps value investing's mystery can be put to rest. Production that leads to entrepreneurial profit is an exceedingly roundabout process, which takes time and capital and thus patience in acquiring the indirect means of that process, we should not expect such entrepreneurial profit to be easy or even desirable as it starts the process and made even less desirable by monetary distortion. To those who understand and can thus suffer through the process go the spoils of capitalism. A Zweck finally attained. In Austrian investing one and two, we have finally reached the destination, the Zweck of the Tao of capital, when brought together, Austrian investing one and two are nested roundabout strategies, the first used to deploy the second, the grand sure strategy of the Taoist sages. Each is a middle to a higher zweck, culminating in maximally productive capital investment and reinvestment, a progressing economy and civilization. The strategies are quintessentially Austrian, with Austrian investing one relying on concepts developed by Mises and Austrian investing two relying on concepts developed by Bombavirk. However, as stated in Chapter 9, Austrian investing one is very difficult for most investors. The only applicable takeaway will be to avoid the stock market when distortion elevates the MS index. Fortunately, the Dow of capital does not require that investors simultaneously employ Austrian investing one and two. Both Austrian investing one and two can be pursued even as standalone strategies, as each on its own beats the vast majority of professional results. To exploit distortion, which also includes the basic Mesician strategy of Chapter 9, and to identify and invest in mispriced productive capital. As a devotee of the Austrian school all my adult life, and having had the pleasure of delving more deeply into the texts during the writing of this book, I can say without question that the influence of the men from Vienna has been profoundly meaningful. The source of any success that I have achieved as part of the market process it has been my intention in this narration to share this knowledge, and in the last two chapters in particular, to provide a practical application and takeaway of what we have learned. No matter what action you take as an investor, once again, what is far more important to consider is the thinking behind this methodology. Are you sure in your approach, taking the roundabout and teleological means end path, or are you Lee, focusing only on the immediate end, the returns of today? It is not for everyone. If it were, the advantages would be lost. But it remains an important ideal for every investor, no matter how they perceive the ticking of the clock. All can stand in the company of Bastiat and Menger, Bambaverk and Mises, and Lao Tsa, Sun Tzu, Clausewitz, and of course, Clip, to gauge their approach. The relevant question to always ask, then, is, how far are you from the Austrian ideal? Let this one query serve as your compass and your map as you continue on your own path along the Tao of Capital. Epilogue The Sisu of the Boreal Forest The conifer, as the light motif of this audiobook, conjures up the essential lesson of the roundabout, going right with its slow yet steady development at first until finally reaching a stage of maturity at which it can go left with accelerating growth that outpaces its competition. The slow, then fast pace allows the conifer to build and configure its structures, amassing the necessary capital, 
such as thick bark, a high canopy, and more efficient foliage. This pattern of development requires tenacity and persistence, the necessary ingredients of the roundabout. The intertemporal world of the boreal forest and its strategies of survival stretch back epochs through twists and turns, growth and decline, and internal battles for survival among competing plant species and voracious herbivorous dinosaurs. In contrast, humans, who made their appearance on the planet much later, remain overwhelmingly anchored in the realm of the present, made all the worse by our inherent wiring around time preference, so that we value, indeed overvalue, today's marshmallows more than the prospect and potential of many more to come. Our societal attention deficit disorder steals our focus away from the protracted path toward our shallow depth of field. Thus, we become prone to making short-sighted, even disastrous mistakes with decisions that undermine the ability of our forward selves, our look-ahead trees, to act opportunistically. Like the conifer, we need perseverance to equip ourselves to triumph over and from falling behind, while never being phased by it, even to the point of loving to lose and hating to win, Clip's paradox, which started us off along the Tao of capital. Because of the sheer grit it engenders, and the prominence of indirect and sometimes costly means it allows, to be roundabout is to expect adversity, as opposed to just the false binary choices of failure and success, it is a prerequisite of the circuitous nature of progress itself, such as we found at the Wei Chi board, where the sure strategist pursues positional advantage for later potential, which until the end of the game appears to be a losing strategy. All the while, the Lee opponent goes for the more comfortable direct assault in hopes of a quick and decisive victory. The great artists and entrepreneurs and economists have well understood that anything worth doing takes time and so have their polar opposites, the military strategists, thus giving us the spectrum of the very creators and destroyers of civilization. Each in his own way has followed the common thread of intertemporal exchange, as explained in Chapter 3, the patient pursuit of an intermediate state, the efficacy of which furthers the realization of a desired final state. And so, achievement of one's eventual zvek only comes after much effort, moving from zeal to zeal, along with a good deal of waiting, even to the point of testing the limits of one's perseverance. Both encourager and sustainer, such tenacity maintains our resolve along the indirect route from intermediate means to eventual ends, a journey we know is nearly impossible, the circuitous road least traveled, because of that very humanness about us. To overcome our human nature takes stamina, the ability to stay focused on and committed to a goal or objective, like the roundabout conifer that moves beyond the reaches of its competitors and hunkers down among the rocks through survival adaptations, such as symbiosis with helpful fungi, all the while waiting for the opportune moment to make its move into the fertile areas after the wildfire. The epitome of sure, the conifer exemplifies the cunning of Sun Tzu's guerrilla warriors, battling across a temporal depth of field, we, too, must possess qualities that are best captured in a word that comes from deep within the boreal forest, where else of Finland. Sisu The world learns Sisu from the victorious Finns. In the early months of World War II, not long after Ludwig von Mises' escape from the Nazis, deep within the north woods of the Taiga, another battle was waged, the 100-day Winter War of 1939-1940 during which outgunned Finnish forces fended off the much larger Soviet army in what is perhaps the best example of sure in modern warfare. Neutral Finland was unluckily caught between the two equally evil and totalitarian clashing powers of Stalin and Hitler, and was thus an immensely valuable path between the two for whichever could seize it first. Although much is often made of the underdog story, we must recognize that the Finns' victory was not some inexplicable event. Rather, it was the result of a carefully executed strategy right out of the Sun Tzu and Vom Krieger. As we will see, the former is evident in the use of Schur, as nimble Finnish troops on skis avoided direct clashes and instead maneuvered into position within the snowy, forested terrain in order to gain the upper hand. Influence of the latter is found in the very conduct of the war, particularly by the Finns, who attacked key focal points along the advancing Soviet lines and thereby fractured a large opponent into much smaller pieces that could be surrounded, attacked, and defeated. 
The Red Army, too, had its share of Prussian-German influence, but Joseph Stalin had tried to purge it from the Soviet forces by imprisoning or executing many senior officers. Thus, the forces that invaded Finland were typically led by less experienced mid-level officers, who at times acted as if they were following fighting manuals written for a different time and place, such as assuming that troops would be able to ski without ever being trained for fighting and firing weapons in snow. The Soviets' unified military doctrine allowed for no flexibility in field command. They adhered to the strict dogma of decisive engagement without question or alteration. Among these many influences and factors that led to the Finnish victory, we cannot underestimate the importance of Sisu. Difficult to translate, a linguistic trait shared with Schur, Sisu has been compared to having guts, moxie, courage, toughness, tenacity, stubbornness, strength of will, and determination. Sisu is perhaps best thought of as a gritty perseverance, making it a natural complement to the strategic positional advantage of Schur. Inherent in Sisu is intertemporal endurance, not gritting one's teeth in a difficult moment, but rather possessing fortitude that sustains along an arduous path, from one seemingly insurmountable challenge to the next. Sisu permeates the identity of the Finnish people, capturing their national character long before they were an independent nation with a gritty perseverance rooted in the land and history. Flat-forested tundra, pitted with lakes and marshes, this isolated land is plunged into Arctic darkness for a significant portion of the year, making even daily life a test of endurance at times. Overlaying such will to survive is centuries of having been a battleground for the Swedes to the west and the Russians to the east. Finland was part of the Kingdom of Sweden until it was captured by the Russians in 1809, and made into the Grand Duchy of Finland, which was then slowly assimilated into Russia. During the Russian Civil War of 1917, Finland seized the opportunity to declare its independence and held off the Russian threat with forces under the command of General Karl Gustav Mannerheim, a staunch anti-Bolshevist, who had been in the court of Tsar Nicholas II. The Treaty of Tartu, signed in 1920, formally established peace between Finland and Russia, Yet even then the lingering tensions foreshadowed another war to come. The strategic advantages against the threatening Nazis, such as the Gulf of Finland, and large nickel deposits discovered in the former Petsamo region, later ceded to the Soviets, baited the Russian bear. Stalin wanted Finland back. Russian propaganda in late 1939 provided the cover for aggressive, overt military action. Imperialists were said to be planning to use Finland to stage an invasion of the Soviet Union, even though Finland, at the time, had a population of about 3.7 million, and the USSR's was nearly 180 million. The first shots of the war on November 26, 1939, were supposedly fired from Finnish observation posts in Soviet territory. Yet historians believe the Minella shots, named for a nearby village, could not have been fired by the Finns because Mannerheim had ordered all guns withdrawn from these outposts to avoid such an incident from happening. Posturing that it had been provoked, the Soviets rolled into Finland in tanks, mimicking the German Blitzkrieg, which had proven effective in the heart of Europe, where there were well-defined centers of supply and communication to be targeted. The Finnish forest, however, offered no such targets, only natural obstacles that thwarted such cumbersome military operations. The Soviets further burdened themselves with truckloads of propaganda material and brass bands to celebrate what was anticipated to be a swift and decisive victory, but without winter uniforms and supplies for a prolonged campaign. What better illustration of Lee can we imagine than a direct assault with plans for a celebration before it even has begun? Sisu and Schur would become an unbeatable combination. Although the Red Army was greater in number and in weaponry, the Finns gained strategic tactical positions by combining the speed and agility of small targeted forces. White-clad bushwhacking troops, guerrilla soldiers on skis, used the terrain to their advantage, becoming like the good general of the Sun Tzu, who calculates in advance and with accuracy every factor so that the situation develops in a way as beneficial as possible to him, even to the point that victory is then simply a necessary consequence. Finland had on its side Singh, positional advantage, the boreal forest itself, that came from deep knowledge of its unusual terrain. As we recall from Chapter 3, the positional advantage of Shur overlaps the concept of Singh, so that Shur is the greater superiority gained through Singh. 
The sting of troops is compared in the Sun Tzu to the positioning of pent-up water in a mountain stream, the potential, sure, of which is eventually opportunistically unleashed as it gushes downward, carrying boulders and logs in a powerful yet effortless surge, overcoming everything in its path. Thus the sage acts by positioning himself upstream from its full deployment. The Finns used means that were far removed from ends, in time and space, and often exceedingly indirect, by blocking roads, conducting ambushes, and antagonizing an overstretched enemy until conflict becomes a war of nerves, which allowed the Finns and their Sisu to exploit the advantages of the roundabout path. At all times, the Finnish forces avoided attacks against a strong enemy on open terrain, particularly one with such superior weaponry and air power. Instead, the Finns fought in the coniferous forests from which their victorious strategies were distilled, of fortitude to endure, persevere, and ultimately triumph. But only through time, with positional advantage obtained intertemporally. The Finns gave ground strategically in order to command a more favorable position, Wei Chi played out on a snow-covered battlefield. The Finns staged tactical retreats, feigning the rout and luring the enemy into position. Then the Finns would emerge, as if from nowhere, having amassed a strategic position unseen by the enemy, and stage a strong counterattack, including raids behind Soviet lines. The Finns' attacks targeted key focal points, Clausewitz's center of gravity, or Schwerpunkt, in the pursuit of intermediate aims, thus weakening their enemy. While the Finns used the sing of the forest for offense and defense, the Soviets were thwarted by it literally. The Red Army strategy depended upon open terrain on which to maneuver. They even brought mostly flat trajectory field guns that proved useless since they could not shoot over trees. Though captured by the Finns, those field guns were used quite handily against the former owners as they retreated. In harmony with their turf and fighting for their homeland, the Finnish army moved with the skill of Twishou, push hands, the objective of which is to exploit imbalance within one's opponent which will make the ultimate route all the more effective. With cold, snow, and the terrain on their side, the Finns effectively turned the force of their opponent against itself. Rather than engage the Soviets directly, the Finns yielded, even to the point of letting the Red Army advance at times along strategic roads, while sub-zero temperatures did damage to Soviet weapons, causing them to malfunction. Bogged down in snow and immobilized by cold, the Red Army could not retreat, no matter the cost, Another foolhardy and highly destructive example of Lee. The sure of the Finns' non-engagement allowed them to spare lives and conserve ammunition, particularly in what the Finnish commanders called the Mati strategy, so named for the quaint Matis of cut and stacked wood, still often found along roads through the forest. The strategic meaning of the term has since become an encircling maneuver, perhaps the closest Finnish word for Wei Chi, or encircling game. Encirclement was at the very core of the Finn strategy, wherein these not-so-quaint Matis were composed of dead enemy soldiers. Under orders never to give up any captured ground, but unable to advance further, the Soviet forces became stationary units, the disastrous consequences of which meant the surrounding Finns could watch as the Red Army soldiers starved or froze to death. Along with Schur, Sisu provided an enormous edge, emboldening the Finns to face incredible odds, such as when they carried satchels loaded with TNT to within a few meters of Soviet tanks, and sometimes right up to the tanks themselves, risking detection as well as death from the blast. Such sneak attacks required grit and patience for the opportune moment to strike Sun Tzu's bird of prey. Thus, a 30-ton tank could be destroyed by a pack of explosives carried by a soldier on skis. As the world looked on, the Winter War quickly took on mythic proportions. Today, the Battle of Suo Musalmi in January 1940 is considered a military classic of what can be achieved in true sure fashion when troops that are well commanded use strategic advantage against a much larger adversary. The Soviets advanced along two roads in the wilderness, intending to capture the city of Olu, a major railroad connection with Sweden, and effectively cutting Finland in two. The Finns, though outnumbered and outgunned, prepared a brilliant plan. Finnish Colonel Yalmar Silasvua utilized the unique strengths of the Finnish JR-27 regiment that had no heavy weaponry, not even a single anti-tank gun. What the JR-27 did have 
was a cadre of loggers from small towns who knew the forest and how to cross-country ski. The timing and ferocity of their guerrilla attacks even unnerved the opponent at times, making the Red Army believe it was facing superior Finnish fighting forces, and certainly not ill-equipped foresters on skis. Such a strategy calls to mind Clausewitz's Vam Kriege and the advantages that cannot be regarded as the destruction of enemy's forces, but only leading up to it certainly by circuitous road, but with so much the greater effect. When the Soviet troops advanced on the small town of Udenshalami, the JR-27 was waiting for them, with a blaze of bullets that blocked their advance. The Finns then fractured a much larger enemy into smaller pieces that could then be destroyed in retreat. The Red Army suffered thousands of casualties at Suo Musolmi, compared to a few hundred for the Finns, and left behind large caches of tanks, artillery, guns, ammunition, and other supplies. In testament to Sisu, Suo Musalmi was Finland's most monumental victory of the war, a perfectly executed rout. When the Winter War ended after sixteen intensely fought weeks, punctuated by a savage bombing raid by the Soviets that was nothing more than retaliation for having been humiliated in battle, Finland emerged victorious and unconquered. However, in peace negotiations, Finland had to give up significant territory, what Stalin called just enough ground to bury his dead. The takeaway here for us goes beyond the Herculean efforts of the Finns in a war that is too often regarded as little more than a side note in the long narrative of World War II destruction. The Winter War serves as a powerful example of the effectiveness of the roundabout military strategy of Sun Tzu and Clausewitz, of indirect over direct, sure over Lee, achieving intermediate gains over grabbing immediate territory, and most of all, Sisu as the gritty perseverance without which such undertakings are virtually impossible. Sisu, of character and character building. The story of the Winter War, of the fortitude of Sisu over military power alone, is central to the stories Finns tell of themselves, like the 19th century epic poem Kalevala, which captures the ancient stories and mythology of Finnish culture, such as Tapio, god of the forest, and Kalevin Poiga, a giant hero who cut down forests, their heroic Nordic Siegfried. Sisu, though, like Schur, does not apply only to martial or even investment strategy, but also much more broadly to living one's life with purpose and tenacity. It is also a reminder of inner strength that enables one to carry on in spite of difficulty and obstacles, speaking as it does of character and character building. A typical Finnish monument to Sisu is a lonely mound of rocks in Lapland, piled slowly and steadily one by one, perseverance in the making. My wife, who is of Finnish descent, can often quell complaint in our young children with one word, Sisu, delivered as a loving reminder to look within themselves for what they need to persevere and ultimately prevail. The benefit of Sisu is becoming increasingly understood today, particularly among psychologists who recognize the advantages it bestows. Angela Duckworth salutes grit in children as a dominant predictor of their future success, describing gritty individuals who make slow and steady progress over time despite temporary setbacks as being tortoise-like. This description should surely call to mind those accelerating tortoises, the tenacious conifers. Capitalism, as we know from the Austrians, is perhaps the grittiest of arenas. It requires enduring current disadvantage in order to achieve a later superior advantage the essence of roundaboutness. We can think of Sisu and Grit as precisely the lower time preference described by Eugene von Bambavirk, overcoming our anxiety in the present, which arises over the satisfaction of wants that will not emerge till the future. The pleasures or pains we will experience later must dictate what we will need now to facilitate or mitigate them. Yet we are ill-equipped to process such projected feelings because of what Bambavirk called the incompleteness of the imaginations we form to ourselves of our future wants, and thus we will not take the necessary trouble to give adequate consideration to our future, and particularly our faraway future wants. The gritty tenacity of Sisu is our only saving grace. It is what got us out of the primordial ooze, out of the caves, out of our day-to-day hand-to-mouth existence, and in many cases such as the Finns, out of the menace of totalitarianism and toward the autocatalytic world of capitalistic production. There is, of course, an element of patience in grit, but not as an abstract quality. It is not just about waiting, 
but rather it is purposeful, teleological, the means to work through a process and toward something. And being tenacious is not about thinking or acting long term, my constant refrain. Rather, it is intertemporal and roundabout, thus becoming a kind of litmus test. If a strategy does not require grit, then it is aligned with neither the roundabout nor capitalistic progress that got us to where we are today. We mustn't forget this and mustn't allow ourselves to be sidetracked by the sideshows of capitalism, the securities markets, and rather stand down from that game and choose for ourselves which game we play. Without the ability to forego immediacy, civilization would be doomed to follow the Phineas Gages who are ruled by their appetites in the now. Perseverance, when coupled with an intertemporal depth of field, enables us to create and configure tools by which our civilization progresses. Thus the words used throughout this audiobook, Schur and Umwig, and now Sisu, unlock nothing less than the fate of humanity. Yet few appreciate the roundabout, because we only see the final product or result, the end of an interval and process, and not the means, the winding path that produced it. Fortunately, we do have role models who have blazed the roundabout trail, great strategic thinkers, decision makers, and actors from throughout history, in every society and in every era, Taoists, militarists, economists, industrialists, the heroic Siegfrieds of the Tao of capital. Across centuries and thousands of miles, on battlefields and through the sweep of the great boreal forest, they demonstrate passionate commitment to universal principles for the teleological pursuit of means toward ends. Drawing from the lives and lessons of these greats, I hope I have given listeners a strategic framework by following its roots, from natural history to the warring states of China and Europe to modern economic thinkers. The concept of a framework as opposed to a formula is an important one. Even Austrian investing, rather than providing precise instructions, is meant to be scaffolding for the roundabout process from which anyone's degree of capitalistic investment can be better understood and gauged. We can think of such investing as a work in progress rather than focusing on disparate results. Thus we heed the Stoics and Bastiat's good economists call to get neither too excited about our victories nor too disappointed by our defeats. I know from much experience, pretty much without exception, that you can always tell an ultimately good trader from a bad one by this simple test. It is equanimity, sisu. When the game is played correctly, the results are but indirect middle to our zvek. For investors, the roundabout of Austrian investing, as laid out in chapters 9 and 10, requires tenacity, which bestows an edge that even seemingly sophisticated Wall Street investors, who may have certain order flow and market intelligence advantages, both of which skirt what is or should likely be legal, cannot match. Wall Street's institutional myopia keeps it playing in the shadows, rather than being able to see what is really going on because of insatiable appetites for the immediate. Gritty Sisu, however, allows one to feed upon such insatiableness in the market, as noted in Chapter 1. My mantra is inspired by a baseball pitcher's creed, who earned his living from the hungriness of hitters. Striving to satisfy only immediate profits, however, is truly, in the words of Henry Ford, putting the cart before the horse. This quintessential entrepreneur of the twentieth century understood intuitively that it was all about ever more roundabout means, patiently and laboriously accumulated, followed at last by impatient pursuit of ends in the final stages of production. From this perspective, we might even see capitalism itself as a zeal, a way station along the path toward a much bigger zvek, a far grander sure strategy. We may be making nets and boats with the intention of catching more fish, but what we are actually doing, over many forward slices of time, is advancing society. The Austrians understood this, especially Mises, who saw in capitalism an expression of the freedom of the individual to act according to free will and self-determination. Thus, in his stand for capitalism, Mises also stood for freedom. How symbolically fitting was it that, in the wee hours of the morning as I completed a late-night writing session, the very top volume of a stack of books on my desk, no less than ten high, suddenly toppled and hit a memento I keep as the symbol of the ultimate victory of capitalism and freedom, a large chunk of the fractured and defeated Berlin Wall. The falling book was Mises's Human Action, and its impact further cleaved the Berlin Wall.
Such images become inspiration for the exceedingly difficult journey of the roundabout. We carry these things mentally as intellectual and emotional talismans, and sometimes even physically. I make it a point, perhaps as a gambler's tick, though like my old Adam Smith necktie, also a constant reminder, to pick up a conifer cone whenever I see one. This happens every day outside my door, whether redwoods in Southern California or the even more roundabout tribes at the cusp of the boreal forest in Michigan. It is as ordinary an object as anyone could imagine, and yet it is extraordinary, profundity in the quotidian, a living embodiment of the tenacity developed from the prehistoric age, when the late-coming angiosperms barreled into the prime areas like so many sprinting hares and drove out the slow-growing at first conifers in a route to the rocky places. As we recall from Chapter 2, by the end of the Cretaceous period, 65 million years ago, nine out of every ten vascular plant species were angiosperms. But let those angiosperms grow impatiently, hogging sunlight and choking off competitors, even from within their own species. The conifers can wait, a phalanx of patient capital producers with time on their side. As an adult, just as when I was a child, the outdoors is my preferred milieu, particularly in the company of craggy old conifers. In this, I am not alone, as Finland has become known as the land of Sana, Sisu, and Sibelius. All three are even combined in the latter's country estate, Enola, a log villa deep in the coniferous wooded lake region north of Helsinki. For the record, Jean Sibelius is probably still the world's most underappreciated composer. Others, the likes of von Karajan, as well as myself, have tried to emulate Sibelius's refuge in a country retreat, similar to the summer retreats of the great Austrian composer Gustav Mahler. One can hear the echoes of their boreal forest home in their sweeping idyllic music. The forest is a source of endless teachings. When I was a boy in Michigan, Hemingway's boyhood northern woods was the ideal child's domain, where rocks, logs, and lakes became fortresses, outposts, and the terrain from which to wage campaigns of exploration and conquest. Sun Tzu and Clausewitz would have been proud. For my friends and me, it was all in good fun. Little did we know we were actually pursuing an important zeal as we exercised our bodies and minds, learned skills, and deployed our imaginations, all essential to our development. When left to their own desires, children can be naturally roundabout insofar as pursuing the intermediate objectives of play, and with a great deal of gusto, even though it does not produce anything tree forts and airplane models notwithstanding. Yes, children will grab for the immediate marshmallow, but when it comes to development, nature tricks them with the enticement of play that is part of the roundabout accumulation of cognitive abilities, creativity, physical attributes such as strength and balance, and interpersonal relationships, all of which will later bear fruit as the skills and aptitudes deployed by a forward self, the adult. Because their prefrontal lobes are underdeveloped, Children are blind to their long-term goals, although their parents tend to have better than 20-20 vision in such matters. Thankfully, children are thus inclined, otherwise they might look askance at play and dismiss it as a worthless objective, while trying to cram for SAT examinations starting at the age of six. I agree with the conclusion of Paul Tuff, who in his book How Children Succeed, cited research that shows what matters most in a child's development is not how much information we can stuff into her brain in the first few years, but rather non-cognitive qualities that include self-control, curiosity, self-confidence, and grit. To that list I would add, of course, in summary, Sisu. Intuitively, we would all want our children to have greater capacity for the roundabout and the gritty perseverance of Sisu, thus equipping them for life well beyond anything material or even the advantages gained through a superior education. With Sisu and Shur come the ability to withstand the direct assault and remain indirect in one's outlook and actions, to never go for the immediate but seek instead intertemporal opportunism. We would further give them the ability and tolerance for deliberate exploration and discovery, what we might think of as production, through a prolonged period of ambiguity and uncertainty, along with a general lightness of spirit, plus the subsequent sweat of exertion, these are the lessons that nature teaches us. To learn them, we must be in nature's classroom. Even for a child, it is nearly impossible to miss the fact that every conifer bears countless cones, which for kids are quite handy missiles to launch at friends, perhaps helping with seed dispersal. 
and within each of those cones are innumerable seeds. Pretty soon, it becomes clear that to cradle a cone in one's hand is to hold an entire forest. What became a fond childhood memory was brought back to me in Clip's folksy wisdom that anyone can see the pine cones in the tree. None can see the trees. None can foresee the forest in the pine cone. And as a youngster, seeing some of those conifers in out-of-the-way places, such as along windswept hills overlooking Lake Michigan, I couldn't help but wonder why they were growing there. Surely there were better places. In time, that question would be answered. With a deep appreciation for the false humility of the conifer sage that only appears to retreat, even in the midst of the rout, the conifer is merely waiting, outliving its neighbors and becoming poised to take over their living space. The conifer's eventual zvek is not achieved by rushing headlong into the fray, but rather by enduring the uncomfortable places on the rocks. Such discomfort becomes bearable because there are advantages to come over time. Longevity is an attribute of the species. A secondary roundabout strategy of the conifer, of course, gives the advantage to its offspring sown from windborne seeds, or in some conifers, serotonous cones scorched and opened by wildfire. The conifer's gritty nature allows it to persist where others cannot. No wonder, then, that ancient Taoist Chinese scholars depicted the pine growing on the rocks as the symbol of stalwart tenacity. Such images long ago painted on bamboo and silk scrolls still remind us today of the endurance known as sisu, of the conifer and nature's compelling logic, that out of what appears to be disadvantage and devastation comes opportunistic conquest. This is the very model of organic efficacious growth in our world. All that wisdom, indeed, the summation of every word in this audiobook, is contained in a deceptively mundane object that weighs but a few ounces, and through which, in the words of William Blake, you hold infinity in the palm of your hand, a humble pine cone. Worth nothing, neither rare nor unusual, it is like the Tao itself, failing to catch the eye or interest, to most its meaning remains unseen, yet to those who know what they are beholding, it is nothing less than a marvel. In the pine cone is a visible reminder of a practical discipline, the tenacious, unyielding pursuit of intermediate means as strategic advantage for achieving the ultimate ends, a quest only possible for those who dare to take the roundabout route.